Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Jiu-Jitsu Times podcast. I am your host, Kevin Bradley, joined, as always, by my co-host, Kevin Gallagher. And today, a very special guest joining us from Kevin's home state of Florida, meaning he has at least once seen an alligator die. We're probably going to get into it. You can catch him on the Octogram uh, MMA YouTube channel, doing a ton of interviews and content creation. Uh, Mark Charles, thank you very much for joining us today, Mark. That was a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much, man. Oh, uh, well, thank you. I just got right off the bat. How does it feel to be the one guy who actually bought a, a Conor McGregor fight kit? <laughs> That's good, Kev. Good stuff. I wore this for a reason today. Did Two it come reasons. with a hand handwritten note thanking <laughs> thank you, you, thank for, you for your patronage? Let me, let me just say, I've been doing <laughs> MMA media for a good part of a decade now, and this is the very first time I've ever or UFC merchandise on the job, or doing any kind of media, and there's a good reason for it. It's two reasons. One, I, can't I, wanna, wait to hear it. I wanna feel like I'm somewhere, like I wanna feel like I'm, you know, <laughs> maybe give give people like the feeling that, you know, myself, that hey, look, you know, that there's still some fandom going on here. Right. Like and you're, you're not two, really in your bedroom right now, you're actually like uh, <laughs> on the scene somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Number two, well, the, the lighting and stuff, hopefully, oh yeah, I've got the window here, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> So, uh, in, in, in reason number reason number two is because I know Kevin's gonna to try to, to to pry an answer out of me today about Khabib. So when I <laughs> when I try to justify Khabib's actions today, I want the shirt to kind of be the balance so people understand it's not a fanboy thing. So I'm, I'm Kevin ready. already tried me earlier. I'm he, ready. I'm ready to get. I'm ready to get in some dirt because I have gotten my own opinions on the UFC. And I, based upon what you said, I have a feeling we may be in the same direction here. But I'm just curious to see what uh where you go with that um very good first of all let's let, let's talk man let's let's just get down to dirt so before we do any of this before we get into the the, the nits and grits of things I, I remind me because i do want to get into the whole reebok uh fiasco and see what your thoughts on with okay. that because i have a particular well, fucking, just, uh, just 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 to, just so uh we have a better staging area how about mark tells us a little bit about himself so sure. that the, there we go. the viewers like that. can get a big better idea of what of Who what kind is of and well-dressed man we're dealing with here today <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, you know, very simple. I'll try to keep it simple. Um, I've been in media and broadcasting for about 15 years now. Grew up in Detroit, uh, you know, Canadian born, American bred. And uh, I've been in MMA media for about five years, you know, uh, uh, covering UFC and, you know, a lot of other stuff and, uh, and covering a lot of Florida mixed martial arts as well. Um, yeah, I've had radio shows and stuff in Tampa, um, terrestrial radio shows and podcasts and with media. Um, I've earned you, Kevin's respect and attention, which means the world to me, people like him that are in the community, quite honestly, are really the, the reason that I've, you know, pushed it the way I have, because they've, you know, that validity that they give me and the, the, uh, they're very motivating. They're not hard on me. Let's just put it that way. So uh, I the always seems been very nice to me. And, and that's one of the reasons that I've kept it going. And um, I just launched the Octogram this year, and, uh, and that's going to be my brand for quite some time. The Octogram is obviously a play on words with the octagon and a, a picogram. Oh, I thought it was Instagram, picogram, but that's, that's just funny. my millennial that, brand. That's good work. That's <laughs> the, 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 at first sight, that's what you're going to think, and that was by design as well. But it's actually the picogram. Oh, there's so, there's layers to this, Kevin. You really just need to unpack it. You know, you got to <laughs> think about it. I am and just as you said. I am uh, equally impressed with you, and equally, uh, you know, uh, like happy for you, and, and 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 glad to be a part of helping to promote you because you are you are a real guy, man. Like I'm always impressed because you, you you didn't just go out there covering the UFC. You cut your teeth covering the nits and grits of local MMA and and and, and doing things in the local MMA scene, which is important because that's how you get to the to, to that's how you get the breaks. That's how you start things, and it hearts and it helps to paint. You know, to shine a light on struggling fighters that are local, because everyone wants to talk about John Jones, everyone wants to talk about UFC fighters, but it's the guys that are struggling to get to that point that really need the exposure. And I, I congratulate you and thank you for your efforts in that regard. I'm humbled. Thank you. Yeah, and I'm glad that you were recognized because seen you, I've seen you do a couple of UFC events, and I'm, I'm happy. You know, as a fellow broadcaster, that you got your shot by by cutting your teeth in that manner. Definitely. Thank but, you. 
speaking it's of it, it sounds Graham. like it sounds like he respects you a lot and i, I can do. tell you we uh, me and kevin have been doing this show he does not respect me at all so like that means a lot that you were able to get there don't you guys worry i'm gonna switch gears and i'll be busting balls in just a oh, second yeah yeah don't don't think this is gonna be an easy one yeah mark will keep you on your toes don't okay he, yeah, i'm gonna, gonna let you go off about i'm gonna let you go into the picograms yeah. i i, I want to see what he says about this so speaking of picograms before we get into the nits and grits of uh ufc island as i like to call it let's talk about mr pika grant himself john jones and the horrible horrible disaster downward spiral that his life has become that wasn't a tear but yeah Yeah, right (laughs) i mean i would cry a little bit too simply the sad the sad nature of the situation the greatest mma fighter of all time if if, if, if the man if the man was uh and i mean no disrespect to any fighter or competitor but if the man was a mid carter or you know, not one of the greatest of all time. This would be obviously much more easily to I, to I digest for everybody. But right. the guy's literally like arguably the best fighter of all time. You know, right. if not, he's the, a top three mixed martial artist of all time. You know, there's really no doubt about that. There's very hard to argue against. So that's, I think, what makes this so big every time something happens. Because if, you know, I'm not going to use an example because I don't really want to go that, you know, I don't want to use anyone as an example, but... You, you know, can Max, say you can say Dillashaw. You know, you, you know who you're talking about. Well, I'm not going. I'm, okay, I'm not talking about PEDs so much as I'm talking about having a serious problem or you know drinking and yeah. stuff like that. But, not, like, but not being able to get out of your own damn way. Right, but we've we've seen fighters that that are that are like that. By but by the third or fourth offense, we're not even paying attention to them. Right. We don't care anymore. Right. He's different. John's right. just different. So it's tough. Um, I don't, you know, in any way, I, I know I'm sure you've seen on my social media, like I'm not, you know, somebody that's going to try to bash him about it. I've already thought hard about it and stuff, mm-hmm. but the guy has a serious problem and I'm nobody to diagnose him or to act like I know what he needs, but obviously he has a problem. I've had, you know, my own issues in my life before, you know, I'm not saying I was an addict or anything like that, but I understand what it's like to have to fight through adversity, fight through your own problems and be in your own way. Um, I understand what it's like to be your biggest enemy and your, you know, so I, I, for me, it's hard. It's hard for me to really, it's you know, attack the guy and, and to really make fun because I've been kind of there before. I've been my own biggest enemy. I've been in my way when no one else was. So you know, I think a lot tough. of us have too. And I, I and believe me, I'm I'm by no means a, an angelic person. I've I've got I've had issues and I've gone through problems and I've and I've battled my way through and, and tried my best to ruin my own life. But at the end of the day, like it's just you get to a certain point where you have to just look at this person. And I, I is sorrowful as I am of the situations that he's in, I it's to the point now, it's almost to the point a while ago that like, I just don't care anymore. I don't feel the sorrow for him anymore simply because I feel like the more we feel sorry for him, the more we enable him to continue to do wrong things because he feels like he, he's still to this day. I have never seen, this is the classic instance of an addict or someone that has these proclivities to show that they're actually trying to do better is when they show true remorse. And I've still to this day never seen that true remorse from John Jones, which leads me to believe that he just feels like I could do whatever the hell I want to do and I'll just get away with it. We shouldn't I, lead, like we shouldn't read too far into that. Well, know? I mean, it's an opinion. It's an opinion. If, yeah, we're talking opinions. I don't dislike the guy personally. I I do feel sorry for him, but I also feel like in in us continuing to feel sorry for him and allowing him to go off the hook, it enables him to continue to be a shitty person yeah. and not grow as a human being. I don't yeah. care about MMA. I don't care about John Jones, the MMA fighter. I really care about John Jones, the person. And if I could see him and tell him these things, I would try to make him see that. But he's not ready to hear it yet. Does it seem? Guys, like this might be the, the the first time where there's sort of a overwhelming population of people who sort of do feel sorry for him. Where really in the past I haven't really seen that. I haven't seen a whole lot of sympathy for John Jones. You know, he has his diehard fans, but this time around it just seemed. You know, and I'm, not, I'm not saying I feel sorry for him. That's not what I was saying earlier either. Just to clarify, I don't feel sorry for someone who's making their own mistakes. He was doing some stupid shit. Like that's fucking stupid what he was doing. Right. But it's just you know the the the. The core of the problem, the, the the root of the problem is obviously addiction. And, and that's what's hard to make fun of a guy about because if he, the guy's a millionaire, I mean, if he wanted, if the, you know, if he could just stop, he would, he has the best life he could, I mean, he could have the best life. You know, he could, he can parlay all the resources and money he has into a beautiful life, but he has his demons and he fights. He could, be the, king, he could be the king of the world. Do you think but, any, this, this might be, uh, I can't speak to him, but do you think that uh, some part of him 
like feels that no matter how many times he defends the championship and like be, be is the king of the hill in MMA, he he is still the brother of a guy who won a Super Bowl. Like, do do you think that's sort of because I I there are are optics to this, you know, MMA is still not there yet really. And I don't know if it'll be there in any of our lifetimes where it'll be like the NFL. Uh, Can I interject in- and ask a question? What, what, yeah, sure. what, what would you say would constitute it being there? What, 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 what key elements would you want to see happen for you to say, Oh, okay. Wow. It's there now. I would say just like, I think we could track it by the the rates at which the components of MMA, like sport, sports like Muay Thai, kickboxing, uh, jiu-jitsu, if, they, if I saw an uptick in the way they were covered and the, the amount of attention that they got, I could potentially see it. Oh, people are now breaking away from MMA in, in large numbers and going to those base components to find things that they really like, that the people that really are interested in all the ground stuff, they start watching collegiate wrestling in bigger numbers, that they start watching ADCC and IBJJF tournaments in bigger numbers, Mm -hmm. or like people go and see one championship just because they're like one of the biggest purveyors of like kickboxing and Muay Thai in addition to MMA. Mm -hmm. But you're not seeing that. Kevin, you know, so- I, I have to disagree with you a bit. I, I believe that you're 100% seeing that. I, I think that you see the amount of people that are signing up for MMA gyms like go through the roof and a large degree of that. And then the exposure that jujitsu is getting and, and none of those things would be a factor if they were piggybacking off of the success of the UFC. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I, I can understand your correlations. Yeah, is it is it football? Hell no, it's not the NFL. Or is it is it NBA? Hell no, it's not I, the NBA. I can easily validate both of you guys. Uh, both of you both of you guys are right. And oh, here's here's um, why. Uh, Kevin- I, I'm really sorry, but we actually just got some breaking news. Uh and I, I figured oh we'd want to I just got it straight from oh, Kit. Wow, so this could be good. This is good. I, we, uh, I don't know if we'll be able to break it since like these go uh, Yeah, whatever, but hell we can talk but, about it, yeah. Uh, According uh, as of ESP, uh, ESPN just broke this. U, uh, Dana White says UFC 249 will not happen April 18th. Wow. Uh, they're going to be. Yeah, we got a call from the highest that. level you can go at Disney, uh, the highest level at ESPN, <laughs> and the powers that be asked mm-hmm. me to stand down and not this do this event Saturday. So as it stands, uh, wow. the card is not happening when wow. it was originally intended to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So that, oh, damn. Mark, are Walt, you Walt are you Disney. tweeting? Are you tweeting? <laughs> no, the phone is blank. I promise. Okay, I was. I wouldn't but, have blamed you. I you're, might more, have to... you're more than welcome to you if you want to. Engage no, no, I, I wasn't. I wasn't engaging in my phone. I promise. I was just. I was kind of crying a little bit inside. Yeah, sure. Oh um, my god. Well, it's a bittersweet. <laughs> it's, it's bittersweet. I. I mean. I, I think we could talk. I mean, we could still talk about some of the things we're talking about. I mean, the show's sure. not, not a wash because sure. we could talk about this this issue. And we I still really have an believe... island that Disney has nothing to do with. Yeah. Well, uh, Disney is <laughs> Disney's still the parent company yeah. of, of WMEIMG. Of, yeah, yeah, exactly. So like, yeah. what, what Disney says is going to go or you're, you're in trouble. I yeah. think that they finally came to their senses in the same regard as why they closed their parks. That, you know, this is this was my fear from this from this from the get go. And I think this is part of the reason why Khabib dropped out. Um, because well, let's concerned. let's go there, Kevin. Because yeah. you, you you mentioned something to me when we were uh, when we were chatting like yesterday, and you 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 and I'm going to quote you. Is it okay if I quote you? <laughs> you can quote me, but I wasn't. I wasn't. I, my opinion is that he wasn't a bitch. But okay. there are people there are people <laughs> out there that believe right. he was. I, you I, can't I, quote me. I well, wasn't sure where you stood with that. I'll, Okay, well, let's just go with that question. There's lots of people out there that, Conor McGregor included, that would say that he's a he's a bitch for dropping out of the fight. Well, okay, so we we can we can spin it any way we want. I mean, you can spin all of this stuff. I mean, we see it happen all day, especially with UFC, and you know, someone pulls out of a fight, it's both people's fault. There's always three. But with this, here's here's what happened. Dana White confirmed this too, and Dana is not a Khabib fan. We all know Dana doesn't love Khabib like by any means, you know. Like Dana came out to to kind of vouch for Khabib because here's what happened. Dana told Khabib and Ali uh, Ali Abdulaziz, his manager, he told them adamantly multiple times, "This fight is going to be in the United Arab Emirates. It's yeah, going to be yeah, in the Dubai. Arab Emirates." Right. He said, "Go to Dubai, train there. It's going to be there. Ninety nine percent. It's going to be there. If it's not there, it's not going to. Basically, it's probably not going to be anywhere." So Khabib, his team, they got on a plane, they flew to the United Emirates. They weren't even allowed to base. They basically weren't even allowed off the plane. They may have gotten off the plane, but they were not allowed entry whatsoever right. into the country. They were rejected. 
And, and then they had no choice but to fly back to Russia, the only place they were allowed to fly. They were not, at that point, they don't coming back to the States was completely out of the question. We already had a travel ban. He, he got, you know, he was stuck between a rock and a hard place. And like I said off the air earlier with you guys, I'm not the, you know, big Khabib fanboy. I'm wearing the Connor jersey here today just because I knew I was going to have to fight for Khabib. <laughs> and I wanted you guys, you know, some of the viewers to realize, okay, well, maybe he's not a fanboy for Khabib. I'm just... I'm just trying to be fair here. And that's really what happened. And, and he wasn't happy about it either. If Khabib was able to get on a plane and come back here and be part of what was supposed to happen April 18th, he was going to do that. And I'm sure he wasn't happy about it. Justin Gaethje is managed by Ali Abdulaziz. That guy ends up the winner in this altogether anyway, yeah. no matter what. He's always the winner with this, which is yeah, a he gets Another one of his guys gets out of the car, so he's going to get paid regardless. You know, I mean, he's going to watch his guys, Khabib and Justin, possibly fight for a title. And, you know, of course, he's sitting back at home thinking, whoever wins, it doesn't matter. I'm, you know, And I don't like that. That's Don King right there. That's what Don King did. And that's why he got shunned from the boxing world, right. because he was managing both fighters that were the, the at the top of the card that were the multi-million dollar fighters. So no matter who won, it didn't matter. He, he got paid, paid twice and he always got the win money. And and he it, it's a terrible terrible system i so, think he but, is i think he is a great case study for why you never really hear vocalizations from ufc managers because he is the only one people can name off the top of their head and i don't think anyone likes him at all <laughs> that's the first i've heard his name but i i can i can see that you know what's insane and 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 i'm i'm sure he's good to them but every one of his fighters talk about him like he is the greatest person they've ever met and they love him and it's almost cult like it's almost like when his name is brought up they go into this mode where they're like oh he's great he has our best interests in mind right. how do you pluralize best interests when you're competing with each other right. so it's you know i i get that he's a he's obviously a good manager he's made a lot of rich people he's made himself rich but there is a whole lot of conflict of interest especially in that lightweight division when it comes to to, to his team um, and that's why it was probably very easy for him to get just get Justin in. Oh, Khabib can't do it. Well, my guy Justin's there. Well, let's it, let's it, talk about it that. Corners for a the second. market. It corners the market, and it's 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 not a monopoly because there's a few other people up there like that. But I don't like the way that it sort of corners the UFC market, and that's why you see a lot of contenders not get any title shots. Let's talk about that for a second. Let's talk about some of the pros and cons because there's definitely pros to having management. Because if, if you don't have if you don't have management, you have what you essentially have are athletes that are trying to dictate the own turn their own terms or their contracts, and maybe they understand that, but they don't know enough in a collective bargaining type atmosphere to be able to get the most for their bang, the most bang for the buck and the things that they're supposed to, uh, to, 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 to get when they fight. And in particular in the UFC, which is known for cutting their fighters out, I think it's important to have someone looking out for your best interests and maybe building some kind of competitive nature to it. What do you think about the pros and cons of that? Do you think it's worth it? I mean, you think there are some pros to having a management figure to, to, to look out for their fighters in order to get their, their best interest in fighting? In, most in definitely. I mean, and I don't, I don't mean to just step in. I'm not sure if you're asking me, uh, but most definitely. Um, yeah. you, you definitely want managers in the game. Just look at the, the Florida scene. These are the same kids that are going to make it to the UFC if they're good enough. And no offense to any of them, but fighters need to be able to concentrate and focus on right. the fighting aspect and, the, and, and being an athlete. They should not have to think about the business. They should give their managers and I'm no expert about contracts, but they should give their managers their standards. Right. Of this is what, I, I'll I'll give you my ten um, percent. Yeah, or well, what Something what is his name? You know, the fighter to give his his manager when he signs with the manager. Here's what I want. This is what I'm going to give you power of attorney to sign for. Anything less than this, don't sign for it. And now I'm going to go focus on being an athlete. And yes, right. they should have managers, but the conflict of interests, conflicts of interest, rather, I'm sorry, yep. should be better identified by these fighters because these are the same naive fighters I'm talking about that need the help are being managed by the same fighter in the same division within a, a one or two of in the rankings of each other. And it's, it's funny. It's that's, that's something that has been, I mean, it's, it's because we, we talk about the UFC and, and MMA as an infant, as an infant organization. Cause essentially it is. We're only dealing with like 10, 15 years, maybe 10 right. years of real quality right. UFC exposure with situations right. where you wouldn't even need a manager. And Kevin, Kevin, you, you just made a point for me before we got breaking news earlier, I was going to validate both of you. The reason that the NFL and the NBA and the MLB have such a big fan base with, because they've been educated for a century right. we've been educated for two decades maybe right. a decade and most of the people watching it five years 
or less. So we are way behind in the education process, as you as you just said. I just I, I wanted to. No, you're good, man. I, yeah, it, it, it makes it great sense. But I think there's also a business model that that is being followed, and that's professional boxing. And I think that that some of the things because you know coming the professional boxing has has had that century long, uh, you know. Uh, frame of reference to go back to and, and the model for, for professional boxing is just what we talked about. And, and it's, that's a, it's not a good model either. And one of the reasons is boxing and pro wrestling both came from the circus, right? you know, and yeah. there you go. And, and a lot it's of the boxing show was, first anything. Uh, all the wrestling was fixed and right. some of the boxing right. was also, was also fixed. And the reason right. that they fixed the wrestling and the circus was, was because these matches would go on for eight or nine hours and there'd be no winner. So eventually they just made it a business. And boxing came from that same place. And when you have a hundred years of dysfunctionality and being in, in crooked, a crooked industry, it's very hard to change because it's grandfathered in. Yep. You know, MMA is very new and, and the UFC is strong, but it doesn't mean that they're going to be the top dog forever. They have to they have to keep that. They've earned it, but they have to keep it. There are a non-zero amount of people that still look at the karate kid tournament, the all Valley karate tournament at the end of karate kid and assume that is, that is martial arts. That is, that's yeah, it. That's all there is to it. That, that, that that's, that it, it's this in art, vacuum. and also uh, that is not me shitting on that movie. No. Ralph Macchio's <laughs> champ. Like I'd, I'd rep that all day, every day, forever. It's amazing. But that, that's a very antiquated and limited idea of what has grown into such a, a very complex thing, you know, like, I don't know. I, I'm just, I'm still reeling, to be honest. I had a few trains of thought and now, uh, I don't know if I clarified this, but it's not just, I just looked at the, I looked at the, uh, the article that Kit sent me. It is not just uh, this next UFC event, but all f- UFC Subsequent events are currently event. postponed yeah. indefinitely. I was wondering when that was going to come down. And so um, that means that it, it is all in ver- it is likely that Chael Sonnen will have the yeah. only combat sports uh, available for anyone to watch because he is somehow able to legally host grappling tournaments in empty grain st- silos <laughs> with a skeleton <laughs> crew and him doing all the commentary for two plus hours. Take my money, please. I I you, you've I done mean, it. You've if, won. If, if that's dog, what we I got. It's definitely him. worth the watch. It's better. I love it, it's more than better than just nothing. I mean, um, for re- I, I was watching Submission Underground 13, and I'm thinking, like, how is this going to go? Because there's no there's no crowd. It is a very clearly a grain silo. It's not. It's it's this is just farm equipment. It's just it's got that feel to it. And but he was talking the entire time. He never took a breath. I don't even think he blinked. <sighs> It, and he was just saying, like interspersed, he's like, "I just got a text from Daniel Cormier. <laughs> like he's, like he's is, trying to keep the, the interest it's going. Probably, like, I got a text from Conor McGregor. <laughs> I love it's it. It's probably just as weird as what it's like to watch the you know Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon without an audience. It's just an odd thing. Anyone that's ever done any kind of public speaking or they any kind to, of like, yeah, they need to, to not have an audience. It's weird. It's so weird. It's the just social- an odd thing. Yeah, I taught an online class the other day. I mean, I taught a couple of them since this thing went down from the gym. And it's very, very freaking odd to not have that personal engagement with an audience. Like you're looking at them on the screen, but it's just a different a different thing to not be able to read their engagement into uh, into your teaching. It's it's odd. Same thing with being like a comedic a comedic uh, inter, inter exchange. Like if you're not really there reading your audience, how do you know if they're 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 getting it? It's First tough day. to watch those monologues. Gotcha. I watched the the, gotcha. the, the Daily Soul, Soul Distancing show, what right. that's normally a daily show. Right. And I, I love that show. And, and it still that's works right. from home. But the monologue right. needs to go because right. he's making a joke and then he yeah. – it's laugh tough. track. Yeah, it's weird. He doesn't. They don't. They don't. They. It's. It's weird how we're almost Pavlonian in that respect. You like that, Kev? Pavlonian. That's for you. You can. You can. Keep I, that hey, one. You man. Use that I, I love the. I love it. I love seeing your vocabulary expand. <laughs> that's that's what I wanted good. since day one. Yeah. I, thought I, I, I said. I, I, I said. In, I said intrepid in the last episode. You thought right. I was making fun of him. <laughs> that's a good one. That's the, a good one. Intrepid is a good one. I don't even know what it means. That's a damn good one. I had the car. I don't know what it means. It's yes. weird that we're like hardwired to to um, we don't realize we, we're so used to hearing that laugh track or people laughing in the audience. It it's almost like we don't laugh at the jokes until we hear the laugh track, which means now the comedian doesn't really understand if it's funny. It's a whole weird right. interchange in that way. Yeah. 
Well, let's yeah. get back. Let's get back to talking about uh, about the UFC and its subsequent canceling. Because I have I have a few opinions on that. I'd like to get your uh, your 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 thoughts on. First of all, it sucks. I mean, it sucks for a couple of because I had very very mixed feelings about the UFC. As excited as I was to see, you know, Khabib and Tony Ferguson, and then Khabib and Gothi, and then Rose and uh, I forget her name, but the other girl, Rose and Namajunas then, and Jessica yeah, Andrade. Jessica and if Andrade, I can just say too, by the way, Rose Namajunas had to pull out of the fight. I think that news came out yesterday. Yeah, and I just want to say before any you know fans get all lippy and mouthy. Um, another uh, piece of news dropped uh, like an hour or so ago. She uh, had to pull out because she's mourning two deaths in her family due to oh, coronavirus. Jesus Christ! So that puts a real human face on this monster that we're fighting yeah. here. It really I does. Think that's, I think that's kind of the point I was going to try to get to because dude, when I saw Dominic Cruz was going to fight Cahudo, I got fucking stoked because that's a good fucking fight, man. That's a oh. real fight, dude. That I was more excited than I was. Fight. I was more excited for that than had he fought Aldo for real, just because so I'm I think like, so too. I mean, Aldo is cool, but I think he works Aldo. Aldo's fighting too low. He's 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 well past his prime. It's kind of kind of sad. I don't even know how he gets a title fight. To tell you the truth, he had a couple of lackluster. He's Aldo. Uh, it's, yeah, he's it's, it's, Aldo. it's the Henderson deal. It's the Henderson yeah. deal. It's the Romero. Deal. I love Jose Aldo. This I, was gonna, I, like, I think the, one of the greatest crimes committed in in modern UFC is the fact that he never got a, he never got a true rematch with your boy that always that always irks me that he never got that rematch with Connor because to say arguably the greatest light, light, lightweight of all time gets knocked out in 13 seconds yeah there's lots of skill involved with it but you could have also said hey could have been a little luck to it we need to give him a rematch for this it was it was kind of sad we never got to see that fight they wanted I don't think he wanted a rematch I don't think Aldo wanted a rematch because right after the fight before he even got his hand raised he looked at Aldo he said we'll do it again we'll do it again and he know Connor would have gave it to him right away wake up really wake wanted. up Jose it's yeah. over <laughs> yeah. I, I, yeah. that was one of that no, was Aldo. Yeah, poor Aldo. That it really was poor Aldo. I still think Connor murks him if they fight again without him, without question, particularly. Now. Yeah, it'll be more of a striking match, but Connor will use that distance and he'll, he'll yeah. Dude, Connor's I, I any again. I've I was a I've been a boxer for a long, long time, and I understand the nuances of 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 striking almost more than I understand the nuances of jiu-jitsu just because it's been so involved, ingrained in my brain for so long. And like anyone that doesn't believe that Conor McGregor is one of the most amazing dynamic strikers in the history of combat athletics is just fooling themselves. The shit that he does in the rings and the, the way he uses his range and the way he yeah. uses his body movement and angles is just at a at another level. Another it's phenomenal. Level. You're you're absolutely right. And I'm not I'm nowhere near an expert or even maybe novice, but I've I've seen some great analytics on his striking and the way that he uses his distance. He's um he's sort of a magician with it because what he does is he'll 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 put his you know his chin somewhere that you think it is and it's actually not there to get you to throw and yeah. it's it's amazing. It's 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 a it's a level up or maybe two levels up from people really knowing how to use their distance. Right. It's different. You're right. I mean, you, yeah. you saw it. Like, I think a lot of that old mystic Mac image was reaffirmed in the cowboy fight. You know, oh, he, was, yeah, 100%. He, he was out for the kill. You know, I, I would have liked to see that fight. I'm sure everyone would have go a little bit longer. Cause I really think that we would have truly got to see the greatness that is Conor McGregor striking against another not just subpar striker, someone that was legitimately going to stand there and strike with him that was a legitimately dangerous person because you know, Donald Cerrone striking is, you know, shit, top 10. You know, he's amazing. He's, you know, his movie ties on his top notch. I, I, yeah. I have an opinion, though, that if it had gone to the ground, Cerrone probably would have been able to handle Connor just because as good as I've, – I've had the fortune of knowing people that have, have trained at Unity – you know, trained uh, with Dylan and a, a ton of other of the the UFC talent that walks through the doors. And Connor is, I've, they've described Connor to me as a competent brown belt. Like he wears a brown belt. It's like he trains in the gi sometimes, and that he is about there. You know, he, I don't know if like they don't know if he would win. You know, competitions or how he would do in like the IBJJR for ADCC or like. Uh, 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 EBI or, or different uh, rule right. sets, but that he is—he's competent. But we've seen Cowboy really shine on the ground. You know, he's oh, yeah. really amazing with the scrambles, strong wrestling. So and and Cowboy and and, and Cowboy's been more willing to throw that st that stuff in the octagon. Connor's been very much a striker uh, ever since I his think, first fight 
Yes. I think Connor's a- <laughs> MMA ground game is severely underrated. And I say that in this terms. First of all, when he's on top, he's he has some of the most amazing ground and pound you'll ever see. Like he is relentless with his ground and pound. It doesn't get as much notice because it usually comes after a knockdown. But like if he's on top of you, his balance and his athleticism is top notch. And he throws down punches and hellfire. Similar to a John Jones, because his arms are so long. So those long arms come from when someone is holding guard and keeping him far back. That straight right hand will still come far enough and make contact the kind of the way that John Jones does. But from a defensive point of view, I think the same thing holds true. He is such a next level athlete that it's so difficult to do anything to him. And if you take someone that is at that ridiculous athletic level, you teach them somewhat of a brown belt level jujitsu, and then you incorporate those freak athletic abilities which destroy their long arms and striking and the tenacity that Conor McGregor has, it's very difficult to oppose or put any kind of offense on for him. Because I'll tell you this, unless you're ridiculously high-level jiu-jitsu like fucking Damian Maya where your jiu-jitsu is unstoppable, it's very difficult to maintain a position when, when, when the other guy's sole intention is only to just stand back up again and fight from there. You, you follow me? It yeah. doesn't take long to learn how to do that. Yeah, and you know another thing to add add to that, um, you know when Connor fought Khabib, and Khabib obviously uh, dominated for the entire four and a half rounds, and Connor had a decent round, uh, but but I think that was Khabib just wanting to stand up with Connor. I and think toy maybe too. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of that. But um, when they were on the ground, as as dominant as Khabib was, he was not able to implement right. what he really wanted to implement after Connor. So what I'm getting at is, yes, Connor wasn't able to stand up very often or at all, maybe. However, he was very elusive on the ground when, when he was in Dagestani handcuffs the whole time. Even so in that, even off of that first that. single leg attempt, he had a, he, he blocked, he caught him with the knee. First of all, he, he caught mm-hmm. him with that knee and dazed him for a second. But even to get someone as high level as Khabib, Khabib really had to work to get that single leg takedown. And Connor almost came around and took his back and advanced the positions on him. But the next level super elite athleticism and, and wrestling abilities to Khabib shine through. But I agree with you 100%. I was going to use that match as a point of reference and say that, like, you know, probably the greatest ground fighter in, in the UFC right now wasn't really able to completely implement his game 100% to the abilities he wanted to because if he made one mistake, Connor was back up to his feet and he was proven it time and time again. Can I ask you guys a jiu-jitsu question? What, what are your, your guys' thoughts on – I'm going to give the two examples, you know – uh, we'll go with uh, Conor McGregor, or if you want to replace Conor McGregor with a black belt. Do you guys remember a black belt that Khabib is pretty much steamrolled through? Uh, uh, Dustin Poirier. Dustin Poirier. Yeah. Okay, right, there's there go. there's a good one. Love Dustin, and I love his team. So it's all you know, all respect. But there is going to be he's not going to get the good end of the stick. But then you've got John Jones, who was a blue belt for a very long time. He's a purple belt now, but he was a blue belt for a very long time. Okay, you know where I'm going, we gotta, right? we gotta, right. hang on. We really quickly got to talk about that, though, just I, because I, so I don't think anyone going? would. I don't know if anyone would call him a blue belt when he was a blue belt. You know, I feel like it's just it. It there's a lot of factors that go into that, and I think Kevin would agree. Like, if you're going belts based on belt rank then Mighty Mouse is a, like a white belt. I don't even think he has a blue belt. He just, he just got a blue belt, yeah. Yeah, he just got we his blue belt. We talked a little bit about that on a pre, on a podcast before actually. We, yeah, we, I'm we just saying so world. like while in in if wow. you're just if you're just jujitsu, then, then belts usually are you're able to tell, but MMA uh fighters if they're training really hard on the ground, they're not they might not be putting as much time in the gi and they might be training in a school that only like re, like belts at the gi. And and they might they might need to see you put in that same amount of effort that you're doing no gi and gi. So you have a lot of secret purple and brown belts that are just walking around that no one really knows about because uh, and they haven't been promoted. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree a lot with what Kevin said in that regard. And so, but I'll also preface it by this: I will say that, like, first of all, uh, MMA jujitsu and jujitsu jujitsu uh, for competition are. Very similar, but never the same thing. It's just not the same game. There are out there are applications of competition jujitsu that you can apply to your MMA, but they have in, in the same way there are applications of your MMA jujitsu that you can apply apply to competition jujitsu. But you have a different nuanced approach and a different uh, you know strategic approach to both genres. Uh, that being said, that you know 
there are a lot of MMA fighters that don't go into the jujitsu approach because there's more to it than belting up. This I don't care. Like there are there are 20 blue belts at my gym right now that will tap. Well, maybe not 20, but there are two or three blue belts at my gym right now that will tap out brown belts and tap out black belts just because they're bigger, stronger, more athletic. They've got five or ten MMA fights under their belt, and you know they could they have that ability to do that. It doesn't make them a brown belt. It doesn't make them a purple belt. It doesn't make them a black belt because their rank is still blue belt. Going up the ranks of jujitsu to that next belt is a way more nuanced thing than just saying, okay, you tap this guy, so now you got your belt. You have to have an understanding of what the requirements of jujitsu are. And as an instructor, we have to see the dedication. We have to see you focusing on getting better at jujitsu and attacking those particular nuanced ideals that progress you from belt to belt in jujitsu before we're going to belt you up. And a lot of MMA fighters just don't have the time to do that because they have to train for their fight and they have to, you know, dedicate themselves equally to all aspects of their MMA training. So in that regard, like, yeah, you know, I don't think that, you know, is John Jones a, a blue belt? Yeah, he's a blue belt. Oh, he he actually got purple belt, yeah. yeah. But is he, you know, would I put him up against probably any black belt in the world and think he's probably going to end up winning that that whatever format rule? Yeah, because he's an amazing competitor at the he top of the He was at Submission Underground. He beat uh, like Dan Henderson. Beat Dan I don't know, yeah. I don't know yeah. how Dan is. Yeah, but... exactly. Well, Dan Henderson kind of falls in that same category. You know, he's he's an Olympic wrestler, sure. but not really a jiu-jitsu guy. You know what I mean? I like, mean there's actually that interest. The only person I've seen, like, directly comment on that was actually Ben Askren. Ben made a comment, like, I think a few years ago just saying i'm a jiu-jitsu a black belt like i've never trained jiu-jitsu i'm just i am like anyone wants to talk about it come and take well, it here's, and, here's and no one did yeah. and like then he had started doing uh seminars with like john donner because everyone was sort of like yeah like yeah no nope, you got it <laughs> oh okay okay fair enough but i mean the first thing that comes to mind for me is just that classical training that i think that would really require a true black belt just that classical training yeah, like really knowing you know so many different factors that 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 pure instinct that that ben askren has yeah i'm sure he has quite extensive jiu-jitsu training but he goes off of a lot of instinct in wrestling and and you know he has a lot of grip strength too and stuff like that um but does he have that classical training can he answer can he teach a, a class right. of brown belts that's very that's a good it's a very good point and, and i mean he could show them elements of wrestling that were probably far beyond their 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 their, their ability to conceive but 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 as far as like teaching the nuances of an arm bar that me as a black belt know from day one to day two like i don't care what ben askren says you know ben askren likes to, likes to blow things up i think the persona First, the person had been asking or two different things, but like, I think would I rather would I rather have a, t a class taught by Kenny Florian over Ben Askren, one hundred percent, right? Just because like Kenny Florian's a guy who can just not tr not do anything for a few years, up and decide to do like a an LA Jiu Jitsu Open, win gold, and then go home. <laughs> like, yeah. Any you know, two guys want to come off the couch so badly. Let's have them fight each other. And uh, that's a good excuse, one. I like that. Excuse me for forgetting if they're in the same weight class or not, but Dan Hardy's been wanting to come back for a long time, and Kenny Florian has flirted with the idea. I mean, uh, Uriah would be Favor came week. back. Uriah Favor came back and won, yeah. and then he lost. But like, and he yeah. still might come back again. He was talking yeah, to, I think, ESPN yesterday. And he how, said, do you, how do you feel about some of these legendary matches they put on Bellator? What do you think about that? Do you think they're media grabs, or do you think they're legitimate enough fights to, for people to be interested in? Well, personally, I think that Bellator, uh, if you asked me that question five years ago, it would be a completely different answer, or even three years ago. They've come a long, long way. So the legendary – legend matchups that we're getting right now are very good ones. We're talking about people like Ryan Bader and Gegard Musasi. Oh, come on, man. We're, we're, yeah, but we're yeah, also talking about, about we're also talking Machida, about uh, you know, like what's, what the hell is his name? Uh, uh, Fedor the, versus uh, Rampage. Ramp <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. Yeah, I get it, guys. But th those are definitely media grabs, but but at the same time, I mean, Fedor Kid Shamrock versus Horse Gracie. That was, that was absolute garbage, but anyways. <laughs> no, no disrespect to Horse at all. But that was terrible. And and it, 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 look, that, that's the thing. Bellator, they they'll the problem is it's it's hard for them to to really get that stain off of them because every time they really get some of it off, they kind of stain themselves again. It, but you know, it, it following on it, following the template of where they're going now because they did they went through that weird little phase 
where they were trying to go the the professional wrestling route where it was all about marketing and, and it was just it was painfully obvious some of the uh some well, of the uh the, the well, work here's the thing they still haven't the they haven't totally shed that you know well, like that's, that's, that's my point that- had that gimme match where Jake, uh, I think his name is Jake Hagar, an actual WWE uh, wrestler, but a, a turned fighter temporarily. He he just beat up a guy that looked like he, he drove a truck for some. He actually works at a meat. He works at a meat factory. Uh, yeah, I and I feel bad. I'm like, what the hell am I watching? Yeah, he's also, a sweetheart. That guy's a nice yeah. guy, man. He, he really was. But but you're right. It was. It, it it is. You're right. They build people in the wrong way, and I kind of have a problem with. Um, with them signing guys who are O and O to, to groom them. It's sort of like having kindergartners and high school people in the same building. It's just a, yeah, it's an odd, it's an odd yeah, you should, I, for, the Be- for, Bellator should be something you work for. It's not something you just automatically yeah. get. Like yeah. Strike Force almost seemed to have more of a pedigree than Bellator. Strike Force one hundred percent was better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I like, think it, the problem there was UFC by the time Strike Force got swallowed up, UFC took all that talent and they were buying all the other good right. talent around the world. By the time you know Bellator popped up and, and Coker came back, they were all gone. Like what yeah, keeps what keeps the UFC from buying up Bellator, you think? <laughs> Scott Coker and Viacom, they, they don't need their money. They're owned by Viacom. Viacom is a, a, an umbrella conglomerate. They they are willing to compete with the UFC. They understand the quality. Um, they understand the content that Bellator actually puts on, regardless of the level of talents, but the quality of production. They understand that MMA is at an all-time high right now. It's like a $10 billion industry. So to, to make my point short, um, they, they, Viacom gets it, so they own the second largest entity in the United States. They're not going to let that go, and uh, they don't, they don't like get it. So that's, let me that's let's, pretty, let's that's rephrase. Pretty, that's pretty fucked up shit. That's that's like fucking. They call that dirty pool. <laughs> that's what my let's, dad. Let's, that dirty pool. <laughs> let's, right, rephrase, that. let's rephrase the question then. Why doesn't Disney just buy Viacom? Right. Well, because there's there's probably like uh, they're probably they got they got that monopoly, marked on, uh, they got that marked on the calendar for like next year. We'll wait. We'll wait. We'll just let Bellator do a few more events in Hawaii where they have tiki torches for somebody. That Disney, was another thing. That was another thing is that like their presentation is a, is definitely a little bit more sour in in terms of like when they went to Hawaii they had palm trees everywhere like the commentators wore Hawaiian gimmicky, shirts gimmicky. yeah yeah, yeah gimmicky. like. I get, yeah, yeah. It makes and all those little gimmicks. I think, I don't know. As a, as a fight fan, as someone that lo- that loves the brutality of professional fighting, those gimmicks just they, it's difficult to take things seriously when mm-hmm. you're looking at. Yeah, no, I agree with that, and that's kind of the reason yeah. that you know the re- one of the only things that this that the Reebok deal was good for. The only thing it was good for was making them look professional. That's yeah. what it's good for. Other yeah. than that, it's it's trash. But um, it. it it, it makes them look like a real professional sport because before that, you know, it, I mean, it, I, I love Matt Hughes to death, but the guy used to come out in a, in a XXXXL white t-shirt yep. and be a t-shirt down mm-hmm. here. And yep. you know, I just, you know, and it, Mark, it, just to segue off of that, look where it led to the fucking buyout by ESPN. So some, somebody's doing something right. They know what the hell they were doing. I'm sure Reebok benefit off of that too. So absolutely. And Dana White was begging ESPN for interviews just a couple of years ago. He was yeah. begging them. Right. That's Literally, why yeah, even, I, Right. And then Brett Okamoto, I mean, that's why Brett was always getting all the stories, Brett Okamoto from ESPN. He's a great journalist. But the reason is because that was Dana White's in into ESPN on a daily basis, whenever he wanted. So Brett you know, was actually the one that interviewed Dana about the story we just broke. Like they were doing a sit down together and uh, it was apparently uh, earlier today. So like he's definitely one of Dana's guys that he has that yeah. is getting a lot of that news. I mean – I mean, maybe he'll make up with Ariel someday, but I, I don't see that I think happening. They're fine. I mean, I don't, I don't know the, the, I don't know. So I'll, I'll admit I'm really speculating. However, from what I understand that happened a few years ago, I mean, Dana himself came out and basically said, and a lot of the employees basically, kind of the consensus was, it's really the Fertitta brothers, the real owners that that stand Ariel, and Dana was more of the guy, kind of that. He was stuck between, and obviously he's going to go with the Fertitas on, on every case, yeah. no matter what's going on. They so were pissed they because he broke that Brock Lesnar thing, right? He, he Dude, he did his Lesnar. job. I mean, yeah. look, the kid did his I job. Know, and you, know know. Who, you know who should be gotten it, kicked out of the building were the two employees who told him. because he told him, right, exactly. I'm a, I'm a member of the fucking media, you dumb shit. You don't tell me this thing. I'm going to go talk about it. And when, he ta- when, and when they told him that, and we're talking history now, but when they told him 
That's, and he had to ask too, because you always double source when you're in his shoes and you're trying to break a story, you double source. You don't go off of one employee. You have to, you have to get at least two or more. He told them he was going to break it. He was like, are you sure? Like, this is real. This is real. Are you sure? Of course, I mean, of course he's going to break it. And you know what? All it was is the UFC just being sour and, and salty about they, they, they fucked up, you know, they shouldn't have let it get out the way it got out. So, you know, Ariel, and when that happened, that when that happened, buddy, let me tell you, that was the day Ariel Hawani became Ariel yeah, Hawani. That, 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 that was the, that was the birth of that was yeah. the birth of the yeah. nose. That there was like no, there ain't no such thing so, as bad publicity in this. You case. know he's glad that happened. It yeah. martyred him. And, yeah. and 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 Stephen A. Smith, who at that time we were glad he was talking MMA, but now we could give a shit less what he thinks. Yeah, I know. Like, hey time, Steven, take a weekend. Bro. Bro. Yeah, I still th- I still think we can talk about that too. I, I be <laughs> Saturdays off for Stephen A. Smith. We're gonna give him paid 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 off on Saturdays. On that on that segue, let me ask you a question too. What do you, what do you feel about um, you know bridging the gap into the ESPN and now the fact that ESPN is actually reporting quite often because they've got an interest, you know, a, a monetary interest in the UFC. Do you feel like that has really done enough, or really done what was anticipated, which was help to make the UFC become a household brand or a, a more recognizable? Um, you know, acceptable brand is, is something that's legitimate. There's no argument against it. There yeah. just really isn't. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, every, 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 you know, every dad and middle-aged guy and every college kid that's flips on sports center that never gave a shit, they're going to give a little bit of a shit now yeah. and they're going to start to give more of a shit. And then they're going to start to become fans. Yeah. It's happening. So yeah. there's no doubt about it. Um, there's just no negative. I see no negative, negative no negative to the espn however the pay-per-view model sucks there is that the business model the pay-per-view model sucks uh, but, but the exposure element and the athletes being there it's as legit as you can get they, they've made it i and I, I, just, I think i real quick i just wanted to touch on how that sort of bleeds into the reebok deal and we even saw this when uh we had we had roxanne Matafari come on uh, a few episodes ago and I missed. I, oh, she's so like she's actually nicer than you think. Yeah, she was really <laughs> cool. She was, really crazy. Sweet. she was really sweet. I, I should have worn sunglasses because she's like a megawatt laser of positivity, <laughs> and it burns That's my awesome. cynicism away. But she, I actually, I was, I was gonna ask her why, like the wig, you know, her wig, and I, I mentioned like, oh, so what, what's with the Goku wig? And she, like, I ended up having to like wanting to bleep it out because she's like, yeah, you can't, I can't legally mentioned it, it that was just a blonde and it's wig. just an alien wig that right. i wear and i'm like wow that's ridiculous like we all know what's like what's protecting who, who's protecting what at this point we all know what that is it's part of the gimmick but and also you had that um uh crud off the top of my head i can't remember his name uh, heavyweight uh fights at bellator now he was in the ufc yeah, he he had to go into an interview barefoot because he had Jordans on his feet. Oh yeah, oh uh, gosh. Is, no, no, all of us. Are, I know who you're talking about. Fedor. That was ridiculous. He fought yeah, they Fedor. Made, they um, made him take. Uh, they made him take his his Jordans, his Jays off. Yeah, he crazy. took his Jays. He's like, I had Jays on my feet. <laughs> oh no, guys, I feel terrible. I can't think of who it was. Yeah. I, that's a, that's a that's a shit story. That's just one <laughs> one thing. One thing. One thing I will say. I think one negative that that falls out of this, just because I wanted to get back into this, is that oh, real quick. Matt Mitrione. That was it. I there feel you like go. an idiot. Mal- okay. This is Mitrione. <laughs> Matt, I'm very Mitrione. sorry. It's yeah. been a long he was day. actually he was actually a hell of a fighter, man. That last fight he had. Was yeah, man. Yeah, 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 for sure. He's always been, he's always been a gamer. He got better and better. I think a true athlete I think, too. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think when him and Shab were kind of coming up, I think a lot of people anticipated Shab to be the guy. And I always, I always kind of thought that Mitch Arone had a little something more than Shab. That Shab was always just too like animalistic and couldn't get out of that like crazy tight uh, UFC or uh, NFL player kind of mode. But Mitch Arone kind of figured out a, a little, a little bit more about to relax and. Be yeah, I think that I think Brendan Shab, um, you know, nothing against him, but he get, I think it, he. I watch a lot of stuff that he's involved in, whether it's Joe Rogan or, or if he has a good interview on Fire or something. The kid. You can just tell he gets in, in his own way. He's yeah. in his own mind too much. Yeah. He gets yeah. it. So you can't be a, a high level heavyweight fighter right. any blank. So 
Oh yeah, I mean you get you go to a certain stage because again he's a an nth level athlete. You know he was a professional athlete. Yeah, athlete and like, but with, get him there, you but know, like, at the heavyweight specifically, the power is the last thing to go. So if you're yeah. if you're not on it, you can get clipped by a guy who's way out of it. Like him beating Crow Cop is insane, just because Crow Cop is. Oh. What is yeah. it? Right leg hospital, left leg morgue. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, well, I think Krokop, I, you know, I think Krokop's had his ups and downs too. I mean, especially when you go between like regulated fighting and non-regulated, you know, who knows what his body was going through. I'm not trying to insinuate anything, but who knows what he was putting his body through when, you, when you're regulated for a few years and then you're not regulated for a few years. And right. so, you know, who just really, it's, He's a killer. I mean, oh God, you guys remember? Obviously, you remember Gabriel Gonzaga, Crow Cop, Crow Cop. Oh, oh, man. oh my God! Yeah. That was those, so those, those are awesome, awesome fights, man. Heavy, heavyweights oh. like uh, I should have had my Pride Never Die shirt. Man, <laughs> I regret wearing this shirt. Yeah, <laughs> seeing seeing Cain Velasquez and Brock Lesnar and guys drop out of the heavyweight vitting and very uh, heavyweight sad. division is kind of like. I, I mean, there's. I guess there's still some quality heavyweights out there, but it just doesn't seem like there's anybody that really has the same like freaking. I think you know, Stipe greatness. is. You know, Stipe was amazing, but he's it's still hard to, he's the champion. <laughs> yeah, but again, you know, he never really had his because you talk about Muhammad Ali and they all talk about this in boxing. Like, like Linus Lewis never really had his uh, Joe Frazier. You know what I mean? Stipe, as good as he was, he never DC. really had his. No, he's a good. I guess. He's yeah, I guess. The, I can. But I, he knocked I, him out. I guess. Still, yeah. I, mean, that, I, I guess. I guess you could say that. I guess you could say that. And yeah, I think that's. I think him. that if they have a trilogy, that last fight will make that comparison. Like can I, I think. It, a, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry. No, 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 no. You go. I was talking. No, no, no. Oh, no, you guys. You guys no. are so cute. I, I you were <laughs> well, I'm just gonna say. I was just gonna say that third fight, and I think both of them have expressed enough interest. DC recently said he understands that Stipe is is working as a firefighter, first responder right now, and that that that's important. He gets it. He's a very DC is always game. Like I don't know why people went through this stage of hating him just because they love John Jones mean. for some. Yeah, no, I just I like that I he always, was I always love I, I like how he smiled and he likes kids and he's yeah. he stays out of trouble. I'm like, yeah. what? Deep what Deep what Deep do on, I, I, as much as I say he never had his guy, like there's it's undeniable what he was able to do. You're still fighting in the UFC against top notch competitors day in and day out, and be, to be able to do that, I always say that when you really talk about true greatness, is it's 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 not just the person that was that flash in the pan that was able to do it, because there are lots of lots of guys out there that could have been the greatest symbol of what MMA uh, you know consisted of, but they didn't make it for whatever reason for an extended period of time. They had flashes of greatness. But you know they hurt their knee, or they got to take some time off, or they got in trouble. Tommy Cruz, never, yeah. So we never really got to see oh, them. So I, I yeah. always say that guys. It's all like Cain Cain Velasquez. Cain Velasquez, exactly. We could always talk about how great Cain Velasquez was, and he was probably at you know in his peak physical shape, probably the greatest heavyweight of all time. I think Fader is right up there with him. But like, unfortunately, we never got to see. The big picture was him because he was always hurt. So when you talk about a guy like Stipe, some of the things that I feel like move him up the ladder is longevity. Because just being able to day in, day out, continually win against top-notch guys, and maybe, yeah, it's not too exciting. Maybe sometimes it's boring. But you know what? You figure out a way to do it. GSP was exactly the same way. Those are things that really constitute greatness. We have to look at and say, okay, well, how long did he remain a champion? How long was he undefeated? How long was he able to either come back and regain the title if he lost it? And those are the things that really make uh, the go. I feel like just as a rule, it. if GSP says he's going to come back, and I don't care if it's at heavyweight, like he's, I'm going to gain a lot of weight and do Olympic lifting and just <laughs> come back. And just and like I think, if he says he wants to do light heavyweight, you should. You know what? Immediate title shot. I don't yeah, care. Right I don't care that he's given up forty pounds and like five feet of height. Where he's getting the title shot, and you know what? He's probably gonna win. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. You were you were saying something. We. I we, hey, no, go on, man. I'm, I'm I'm I was born in Canada. I'm a GSP guy. Oh, oh I man. don't let yeah. me go too deep in my GSP. <laughs> I can get I can get offensive. With are you from Montreal? <laughs> are you are you are you a Montreal guy? Oh, for real? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be there. I'll be, March, I'll, I'll March, I'll March, I'll March, I'll uh, British Columbia. Okay. Montreal is probably one of, one of my favorite cities in the world. Montreal is so beautiful. I've been there once before for a UFC fight. I actually went up to go watch uh, GSP and uh, Kevin. We got to let the guy man. from Montreal talk about Montreal, man. Go ahead, bro. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you were, you, were, you, were say, you were saying something uh, regarding like uh, those types of fights at heavyweight 
or like at Stipe specifically. He never had his Joe Frazier. I'm trying to recreate. Sure, I, got you. I remember. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Um, I'll just reiterate first that I, I still regret wearing this shirt. So I'll start with that. <laughs> oh, I <laughs> so, don't. I don't. <laughs> I'm, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not a hater of Conor, of Conor McGregor, but I still think Khabib wins that fight. But we don't have to talk about that right now. Uh, you're probably right. But right. so here's here's a, just kind of a, a bold prediction, if you will. Um, you, you you want you want another Cinderella for Stipe? Um, bold prediction, and maybe just maybe speculating fantasy speculation. Uh, Jarzinho gets knocked out by Ninganu. Ninganu gets the shot against Stipe and knocks him out. And now you have your trilogy. Yeah. That's a, that's a good one. That's a good one. He already beat. He beat. Uh, he beat. He beat a guy. Right? He beat a guy. Right? That's why you'll get the trilogy. That's what right, I'm saying. Yeah. He'll come back in his knockout, yep. and oh, uh, and then now you have now you have another really big trilogy. I mean, God is the scariest guy. Who's, I mean, I don't. More, yeah, who's more frightening? I mean, maybe Derek yeah. Lewis is up on that list, but like, there's no hype. hype. It's not yeah. even hype. I mean, dude, look at poor guy. You know, one of my murderer. favorites of all He's time, Overeem. Yeah, Alistair Overeem. Over yeah. The way that he hot dukened him into midair. I thought he was dead. I thought it was gonna knock his damn head off. I like UFC. I like MMA, but I don't like that stuff. He's one of uh, <laughs> number he, one bullshit. He's one of the ones <laughs> that Joe Rogan always talks about is the most physically imposing specimen of a human a being he's ever he seen. He has like, the world record. Like, yeah, 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 he did punch. the machine. On the he punch did the machine. machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, dude, he's just a, a ridiculous specimen, and it's what it, and it's it's pure genetics with a guy like that. And Joe always talks about it. He's not. He's like, yeah, I used to work in the fields and shit, man. You know what I, I mean? Wanna, I here's the, like here's the thing. I want to sit Francis down in like a chair that can fit him, and I'll have a smaller chair, so we're both in equal chairs to our body mass, <laughs> and just say, look, Francis, I'm not going to lie to you. You could have go on to have a very successful career in the UFC. You're already done huge things, or you could potentially save the Jets franchise in the NFL. <laughs> what do you say? We get you in pads. No right. one would say anything if you just showed up and were in pads. <laughs> Run the 40, do the combine. Well, yeah, you can bench press 225 for like a, a whole day if we leave you there and don't tell you to stop. Like, <laughs> I have a, a funny story that's similar to that. Do you guys do you guys ever watch any pro wrestling growing up at all? Oh, huge. Just okay, absolute. Uh, Monday you, I'm night older than you, so I don't know a lot of like the – the 2000 guys. No, like, I'm going I, back I, to I know, late like, 80s here. Late 80s. Yeah. Late 80s. All right. Late I, I, I'm, that's, that's, this my, that's guy my, wrestled that's Hulk my Hogan in WrestleMania. WrestleMania, not nine. So it was a wrestling. I forgot. Anyway, no, sorry. It was Undertaker. But anyways, so Giant Gonzalez. Who remembers Giant Gonzalez? Oh, he was, was he the guy in the, in the suit that had the fur on it? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, he that's was a impressive. giant. His name in, uh, in, in WCW down in Atlanta tech, with Ted Turner was El Gigante. And then when he went to Vince McMahon in WWE, he was he was named um, Giant Gonzalez. Yeah, that's when he put that fur suit on, which is ridiculous because the guy was a a, a physical specimen. Did, yeah, didn't he? Didn't he premiere at that that summer that that um? Did he premiere at SummerSlam or Bash at the Beach? No, no yeah. Listen to you, listen you, know, to you he, fucking nerds. No, because <laughs> he, he was at WWE first, and here's here's the story, and this is great because it, it reminds me of what. Uh, you remind me of this with uh, talking about bringing in Ganu into football. Yeah. Giant Gonzalez was brought by Ted Turner from Argentina to play on the Atlanta Hawks. I, I do remember that. I that remember didn't that. work out yeah, very good. well. But so now Ted he's got Turner him. also owned WCW World Championship Wrestling. So next thing you know, Ted this Atlanta Hawk was a pro wrestler. They're he's like, got oh, we're not gonna- he's got his thin mustache. He's like, yeah. I have a giant. Yeah. Where do I put him? <laughs> Are you doing yeah, dude, I gotta find No, I was just saying the most. I he's a goddamn giant. I can make money off this fucker somewhere. Ted Turner is a great guy. I love Ted Turner. By the way, this is another great. This is another great um, sort of a gem. Or, or nobody's really even brought this up before. I think I brought a radio show that nobody listens to. So this is interesting. <laughs> just, don't worry. Nobody really listens to this either. So we're, Kev, actually, for the we're last really fucking really. time, you got to stop <laughs> negging the show. Like, it's, it's not just bad for me. It's bad for the brand. <laughs> You're right. I'm no, sorry. We're sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> people people no, watch no, the show. No, 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 no. Really Mark, do. don't defend. Don't defend him. He's don't. done this like a bunch of times and I keep asking him to stop and he won't stop. <laughs> I'm sorry. Kev poor me out, man. man. I just, I just eat a pot cookie and go sit in a chair. <laughs> We're gonna probably edit that part out. Uh, it, yeah. All right. So, all right. Ted Turner that we were just talking about. He owned World Championship Wrestling, which was like the big competitor against Vince McMahon's WWE. They went head to head in the Monday Night Wars, 
And I'm really sorry if I'm boring the, the jujitsu, uh, you know, purist. No, man, as quick as possible. But, but, but at that time, Ted Turner was what was a pain, a pain in the ass for Vince McMahon for 83 weeks straight. Ted Turner and WCW yeah. beat Vince McMahon in the ratings every yeah, week. I, I remember weeks. watching that. I remember watching a little bit of that in that um, that uh, what's your, what the hell was it? The, the Andre the Giant. Oh, the they kind of get into yeah. that a little bit. The oh, Ted Turner, was, uh, Vince McMahon stuff. So. So now fast forward to now and guess who Ted Turner has on on the same channel as a weekly program, one championship fighting. <laughs> so now he's going after Dana White. So, so, and yeah, he's he's like, going after Dana. Yeah, and, yeah. and I'm not making this shit up. It's it's, it's Yeah, he's, he's, he's known he's known for that. He's he's known for 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 trying it because it's it's just something to hey, it's on the same time. Maybe you go to the wrong channel now and he's like, oh it's true, I'll just watch this instead. Imagining yeah, that's, that's knowing that. what I know about Vince McMahon and Dana White, I can't think and the the fact that they're both friends with the president. I cannot wrap my head around a worse pair of guys to make war. I don't care if you're Ted Turner. <laughs> Vince McMahon's talked about wanting to murder his own father. So I mean, <laughs> well, I will tell you this: Vince McMahon and Dana White they don't have a public relationship, but trust me when I say they have the WWE and the UFC have a very direct relationship. So direct, in fact. That, that that Dana White and the UFC on multiple occasions have visited the WWE headquarters to consult with them on many things. Um, uh, I, it might have been the Fight Pass when they were launching the Fight Pass. They they might have consulted with them on that. Don't quote me on that. But um, they have a real relationship. A, a, it's just not public. They really do. They they work like, together. So they so, work together. So yeah. Vince, we want uh, Habib right over here. He's gonna jump over and attack this guy. Yeah, with Brock Lesnar. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 the, and then Ronda, 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 Ronda almost Ronda. Like, like two teams no. tr- swapping stars. What like, was the other guy, Punk, uh, CM Punk? Yeah, let's not talk. Yeah, yeah. Let's not talk yeah, about that one. But That's, it's the uh, same thing. It was definitely, it definitely bought hype. I they they definitely Ronda understand it. Blue belt. He is yeah. like he just got his blue belt. Aren't they both guys, owned by the same? I'm sorry, I know you don't want to talk about him, but I have to ask you guys: How do you guys rate his jiu-jitsu, or if you know anything about it? What, okay. what say that again. CM Punk's jiu-jitsu, just jiu-jitsu, uh, is, not nah, fight. I mean, nah. I mean, I from what I saw, I mean, he's, I mean, he's only been training for you know a year or two. I mean, to, no, to call him a blue belt. yeah, I mean, I didn't. It didn't seem. Uh, like. Okay, well, he was because, fighting for two years at the time that he fought. Yeah, the first that's time. still yeah, not it, really it enough. He was training infrequently at the Torrance Gracie Academy with yeah, Henner and Huron. Right. I which, know that. Which is he really started good. getting <laughs> really serious <laughs> about it. Central, right? Yeah, yeah. he yeah. said he started getting serious about it when he moved to uh, Rufus Sports to start training MMA, and that's right. where he got striped and belted. And I think he still trains there now. I mean, I don't know if he's training jujitsu still. Like, I know he got his blue belt after his fu- his second fight. I don't know, man. I don't even train. I think I can take Mike Jackson. It's ridiculous. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> I think I think everyone so here sad. has a fairly decent shot <laughs> at beating CM Punk. Let's just say that. I think. You know what? I, think, I have a real. Kev, I have a story. You would, a, you would just like. I want to see. I, I, Kevin, how fast would you submit CM? Punk? Uh, I'd have fun with CM Punk. <laughs> I mean, I'm CM sure he's Punk, a big athletic kid. But I mean, he's I, not. I, He's yeah. not. He's he not doesn't really look right. athletic yeah. at all. Dude, hear me out for real, real quick. When I lived in Canada uh, for like five years between 08 and, thir- and 2013, I worked with. Um, I'm not going to say their name right now because they had gotten into a lot of trouble lately. I don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to search you. We talk about it after the air. <laughs> no problem. No problem. But 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 um, fans are going to know exactly who I'm talking about. Wrestling fans, if mm-hmm. you know. Um. This this wrestler that I worked uh, I worked closely with I was kind of managing him uh, like a real manager like business not in the ring I was managing him for like a little while and uh, he would tell me like all kinds of real wrestling stories and this guy was a part of a wrestling royalty family there's your hint I'm sure you're gonna know who it is now but uh, in Canada I wonder who it I wonder be. who right so he, Did he told me take your heart Mark. <laughs> I never gave him a chance. Girl, I only like women. Dude. <laughs> but, oh boy, I'm gonna have to him, that one. <laughs> he, he's a little bit questionable when it comes to that, and that's that's his. You know, that's, anyway. that's why he got in a lot of trouble. He's a he's he's got his own problems. But anyway, yeah, but so CM he Punk. got into he he's he's a very disrespectful kid when it comes to the wrestling business. Yeah. And CM Punk is a real pro wrestler, pro wrestler kind of guy. Yeah, oh, and so they, what, they liked him. He had a lot of clout in the community. 
Yeah. So what happened was one day they're at a show and and this guy that I'm talking about kind of shit all over the show, did some stuff he wasn't supposed to do, blah, blah, blah. And uh, backstage, CM Punk, because this guy I'm talking about, everyone's afraid of him. No right. one wants to fuck with him because he's part of royalty. Plus, he's right. he's jacked and he's crazy and he's a yeah. psycho. No one knows yeah. about him. CM Punk took him outside and beat the shit out of him. And yeah. the person I'm talking about told me that. He was yeah. like, dude, CM Punk was the, and this is years before CM, this is about seven years before CM Punk started training jujitsu. Right. Way before. He was like, CM Punk's the only person in the business that's ever had the balls to take me outside and beat my ass. Hmm. So, you know. Well, it yeah. could be this guy, guy just sucks. Sucks. It could just be that this guy <laughs> but sucks. Still, yeah, but it's I also I saw this guy beat like... two dudes up in Canada. I saw him beat two muscle-bound dudes up. He's he's my height. Yeah. I'm yeah. Not, he's my height. We were walking out of a Japanese restaurant, and he's the type of guy to wear a jacket with no shirt underneath. Oh, <laughs> Nicky <laughs> Rod vibes. <laughs> Nicky <laughs> Rod vibes. Right. <laughs> But he's jacked and shit. So we walk out and these two fucking dudes who are like six foot something each, they're like laughing, calling something like whatever. And I'm like, oh, fuck. And I'm like, get in the car, get in the car. Get in the car. No, fuck no. <laughs> he's fucking, one of them's on the ground in two seconds and the other one's fucking like in the restaurant. It was like, I've I'm known, like. I've known so many guys like that crazy. in my life that are just like straight liabilities. Like they're probably going to win the fight. But at the same time, it's like, dude, I don't want to fight. Why are we fighting right now? Oh, Why is this you... happening? I don't care. Let's just shout go. Out to, shout out to Ruben for, <laughs> from the hey, last episode. Ru- Sorry, please switch gears. This is a really riveting story. Did you guys see Anthony Smith's interview with Oh, Errol my Blair? God. Yes. Yes. That was oh insane. For that any of insane. our viewers, for any of your viewers yeah. that are unaware, uh, Anthony Smith had to fight off a uh, home. Uh, was it one home intruder or it's one? Multiple? one. It was one home intruder that was trying to uh, steal from Anthony Lionheart Smith. Right. Think that is the definition of we didn't look in the yellow pages for who to rob. We, <laughs> no, just right? we definitely, we, we just definitely picked the, picked the house. wrong house <laughs> of all it's the houses crazy. and all the blocks and all That's the neighborhoods. So, oh, that was like the third house he was in that yeah. night. Yeah, yeah. Oh. it's insane. The story's so, crazy. The, yeah, so the story was this: this guy was mentally insane, mentally unstable, and he was he was, he was a younger meth. kid. Like he was like tw- yeah, he was probably a meth or whatever was the issues, but he was in his mid twenties. And he was just going, breaking into people's houses randomly because he was on drugs and, and, and out of his mind. And he ended up breaking into, uh, I was Alex, Alex Smith, right? Alex Smith, Alex Johnson, I figured. Alex Smith. Alex Smith. Alex Smith. Alex Smith, his house, who was a UFC lightweight heavy or light heavyweight. And um, like he was just standing in like his spare room, screaming at the top of his lungs and woke up. You know, uh, Anthony's wife came in and told him about it. He had to get out of bed and go deal with it. Apparently, it was the hardest fight he's ever had. The guy turned out to be like some high school wrestling champion from what? fucking Nebraska. Yeah. Yeah. There, there was. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't see that. Yeah. You no. didn't see that. Yeah. I don't know no. who wrote that story. I saw it somewhere. They actually, they found, they noted who the guy was because all, the whole time Anthony Johnson or Anthony John or Smith is talking about how, uh, you know, this was the hardest fight he's ever had. Like, he don't, I mean, he's like, I'm a professional fighter. I'm a light heavyweight in the UFC. And like, I just couldn't hold this guy down. It was insane. Like I was fighting for my death. And the whole time, the story is riveting, right? Well, they found out that the kid was like some high level high school wrestler. That was like, you know, that was like a national champion or some shit like that from, from we'll fucking, send Kyle like, Cozier after his ass. Beat him yeah. I feel right. like, I feel like sure dog out of respect needs to add another win on Anthony. No, contest. no, no. The guy got arrested. That's a loss on his part. Like the yeah, rules are different at this point. <laughs> I've done a lot. I've done a lot of things, man. I've done MMA. I did jujitsu. I did boxing. I've done a lot of shit. And there is nothing that is the same as a real life fight. There's nothing. There's nothing that 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 is the same level of anxiety because it matters. Because now you're not fighting just to fucking win a fight and put your hand up. This person could actually get up and, and harm you or your family, or your friends. And if it comes to a point to where I mean, it, I, mean I work like I said, I work in a, in a in a dive bar, so I got to deal with this shit all the fucking time. Um, and like when it comes to an actual altercation where you have to defend yourself, and it comes to that point, like usually means like there's someone particularly with me because i don't fight i don't give a fuck but if i have to come after you it means i am in fear for myself or my immediate surroundings so i am to the nth degree there's nothing nothing that comes close to that so anthony johnson like you know particularly when you got someone that's fucking on drugs and fucking trained like you know mad respect to you for that that's insane and and the fact that when it was all over 
And this kid who had just been in this long, I, he said it was probably around six minutes long of just fighting. He was just outside in handcuffs and just bleeding all over his face. And he just looks up at Anthony and all calm. And he says, Hey man, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. Just, it was, it was, it's just obviously just a deranged person, either high on drugs. The article I read, I wish I had it to reference it, but I did read it the other day. It said something to the terms of like, he was uh, mentally unstable uh, that, you know, was just wandering around office meds or whatever the fuck it was. And just was wandering through people's houses. It's I insane. mean, yeah, this is a weird thing to say, but shout out to to Lionheart for you know being a compassionate human, just because yeah. he could he could have killed this kid. Yeah, one hundred percent. He could have murdered him, choked yeah. him until his head popped off. Yeah. And you know, yeah. he was he he used his superior knowledge to to keep this kid from hurting anyone and hurting himself. You know, so that's that's that's. The goal, you know, that's the goal. That should be the goal of all martial arts. You With know, you great don't want power to comes great responsibility, just like Uncle Ben would say. Yeah, <laughs> Kevin is like Uncle the Uncle Ben of the Uncle 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 times. Not, yeah, I shaved my beard, so I'm not the same. Yeah. I oh, get, yeah. <laughs> before we lose track of time, before we get to see late, I really want to talk about uh, about because we this has been a great show. We we I'm having fun. Awesome. I'm, I'm good. Oh, I'm but I want to get to what we, we came in to talk about, which is what, what went down with the UFC. We, we, were, we were actually, it's funny, because during the course of the show, we were excited to talk about the upcoming event and then break down some of the fights, and then we get the, the heads up that, hey, guess what? It's not going to happen. So <laughs> Slips but, through my fingers once right. again. <laughs> the first thing I really want to talk about before we start talking about the fights, because it would have been sad. I mean, the, the, all the fights would have been amazing fights. I go, the, the, the card would have been good. I was even excited to see uh, Tony Ferguson go to Goethe. I think that's And UFC fight. or MMA has, is, is perfectly fine with without an audience it's not like yeah. comedy or pro no. wrestling no, you know you don't you don't need an audience it's, you, you, they do that all the time for the ultimate fighter shows and it, it holds up just as fine it's not the yep. same you know, absolutely not, not in play um what i what i think about when i think about it is this because i re- immediately when i found out that dana white was doing this i was I was torn because part of me was like, wow, this is awesome. You know, this is something that we can say that as a return of normalcy, I'm super stoked about seeing this fight. It's something that as a country in a, in a weird way, we can all get behind and be like, fuck yeah, dude, we're totally stoked to see Tony Ferguson. At least we're going to get to see Ferguson and Khabib fight, you know? Um, but there was also the pragmatic side of me that thought there was a few reasons why it was irresponsible and dangerous and i had jeff bailey on my podcast early on the only rapping hour we were talking about the same thing and he gave me a perspective that i wasn't even thinking about um so first of all i mean more than anything i think it's unfair to put these fighters in harm's way the way that the 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 administration the ufc and the and their the brass are doing simply because we're dealing with a situation where there's a deadly deadly disease running around it, it kills you now if you're normally healthy it probably won't do that much damage, but if you're immune compromised or you put yourself in a position to where your body isn't fighting off infection to the best of its ability, which i.e. is also what happens when you cut weight, you train super hard, you put your body through the rigors of what an upcoming fight will be like, it's, it, yeah. would, it would have been very sad for me to see a disease that's so easily contagious run through and knock out two or three fighters or even one fighter if anybody died simply because they were trying to perform for the ufc like what number what what can you quantify that with a number you know well, it's, if just, you're, it's not if you're by any chance looking for devil's advocate um I, you found him because yeah. i i just read before right before you brought me on the show um and by the way thank you again for having me on i'm having a ton of fun and you guys do a really good job you, you tell me you're gonna piss really me off job. real bad i'm gonna tell you to fuck off <laughs> You <laughs> can't be mean to our new friends, man. Like we're not, no one's gonna call us back anymore. <laughs> in, in media, we call it a positive sandwich. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Dude. Tell them something good. Tell them something bad. Tell them something good. Yeah, right. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm joking. Um, so uh, this news also came down like right, you know, right before I came on the show, and it was that Dana White was assuring. And this is before the cancellation came came to light. Um, probably just hours before. I mean, this is all so fluid. But what the news that came down was that Dana White was assuring that all of the UFC and team members were all going to be able to have COVID-19 coronavirus testing before they got involved or before they actually traveled there. So I don't know how that was going to happen because right now, and I I promise I'm not going to go this direction, but right now we're having a hard time uh in, in america we're having a hard time testing real sick people who are ready to croak 
Right. So right. I don't understand with all the power and the money that Dana has, you know, there is definitely a morality issue there. Right. Right. So they were going to test them. So if, you know, if there was anybody who, who tested positive, obviously they wouldn't go there. They wouldn't be around everybody. But at the same time, it's, you know, you, it's, it's still a mess. And, and, and you're right. I think the, the the side effect of that is is like how often you test these guys. You're just going to test them, like because right. it almost you can't you have to that like you have to right. test them like during the training camps because that's when they're going to get sick. You know what I mean? It's irresponsible. Like okay, cool, go home to your own homes and test and continue to walk around the streets and again put yourself subject yourself to the rigors of what a training camp would be when there's this potential deadly uh, disease running around and then we're going to ship you out here to fight. You would almost have to ship them off to train specifically for the next month in, in a, a vacuum area. chamber, you know, just, yeah, like, in a vacuum chamber just to make sure that they're safe, which well, I mean, let's talk, let's, that? let's talk. I think, I think we can actually have some fun with this because they, they did sec, you know, secure an Island to be used for several months. <laughs> UFC now, Island. God, I wish that would have been a thing. I would have had so much fun with UFC Island. Well, was, no, like, like, this all started, this started because originally there was this meme going around about the fight boat. Like this, like you saw pages like strangle squad on Instagram going like we, there's only one solution to this problem there's a lot of cruise ships that are so big that you can have it like you could they go in international waters they're like a small island you get on it you barely feel the ocean you know let's have a fight boat dana white needs to buy a fight boat disney needs to buy a fight boat we need a fight boat <laughs> and you just it was like a yacht with an octagon on it and so like you two have, people <laughs> a ufc fight boat would would obviously be big business just imagine that right like they do cruises yeah, they and do they're like boat, ufc yeah, cruise the ufc cruise ship. that would be big I business. Mean, it'd be every oh. every wife's nightmare but at least she gets to go on a cruise you know now you got one cruise that guys want to go on <laughs> no right. kidding yeah, no right. kidding other than the jericho cruise of course right yeah right. Oh, that's a good one too <laughs> um but so the, but the island i mean they were going to or who knows what's going to still happen right we really don't know but what with the island was we're not going to it's like they weren't going to tell anybody who where it is it's like put this blindfold on get in the car and we're going to take you it's it's like the closest thing i've ever seen to like a mortal combat and dana white <laughs> is shang Tsung. it's amazing right. it's kind of yeah. cool or, right or in, in, enter the dragon or something like that well, right. okay. It was also like I, I'm I'm seeing that it might have actually been like the Tachi Palace Casino Resort near Fresno. That's what, that, that's like, what, they, that's what it cha- it was originally was it going to be the island? Then Dana well, White found yeah. out. If I can, if I can, I'm I'm a stickler with the stuff. Oh, okay, so, ah, no, I mean so, you, we're here for your sorry, ex- we're here sorry, for your yeah. expert advice on it. your expert. Um, uh, so both locations are valid. The 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 Tachi uh, Tachi Palace Casino and Hotel. Um, the tribal land in California was going to be used for all the domestic fights in the U.S. that were scheduled, and the island was going to be used for all the international fights that were scheduled. Oh, that okay. Was the plan. That, that's, that was the oh. plan. They made that pretty clear. Well, there we go, man. Yeah. Um, well, you see, you're like you saw problems emerge when you realized that like Aldo was being kept in brazil because of visa issues because no one's going to re re up right. your work visa in the middle of a global pandemic right and obviously this isn't something you pl- necessarily plan for so i i'm like no one no one's getting on him for this whole thing happening it'd be actually irresponsible of him to probably try and re-up his visa right now right but the number of moving parts that have to go into a UFC fight, the number of things that like you've seen, we've seen yeah. fights almost not happen. Like John yeah. Jones, they had to move up and move uh, his fight against Gustafson. You gotta, you gotta have a crew. You gotta have a yeah. film crew. Like, you gotta I mean, have, like, you gotta have, hotel you can't, crew. You can't hotel do catering. this. You can't do this and only have like a 10 person. Like it's just, it's going to be a hundred, hundred people there at, at any given moment. It's just, yeah. And you know what? I'm, I'm going to go, um, go ahead and, and say it, I, and that I'm not going to gain any friends in you know Florida with this one. But when Combat Night did their show, I understand how everybody saw it as as a positive, you know, positive and all that, and like, oh, they had a different setup. And I think what they did was they had three different buildings. Yeah. Um, they did it in Tallahassee. They had three different buildings. So what they do is they'd rotate people. They'd let people know when it's time to come to the next building to get warmed up to get ready to fight, and so on and right. so forth. Right? I could get and, that. Yeah. Hey, look. 
still weird. Much, much credit to Mitch Kamali for for actually trying something and doing it different. But my the first thing that came to thought was all you're doing is rotating people yeah, into right. the same spots, and you're not. You're probably. I don't. I'm sorry, I wasn't there. <laughs> right. I've been to quite a few not, MMA events. They definitely not were sanitizing, sanitizing everything. They're not, cleaning that shit. they're not fucking. I've been. That's. I've never. Every time I've ever competed on a, on an event, I've always the only time I ever get a staff infection or a ringworm or something disgusting. And that's like not that. a knock that's on. Not too disgusting. That's not a knock on them or on Mitchell as wow. a promoter or anything. That's just that's just it's just common sense that yeah. that, that I thought. You know, I was like, you know, I get it. It's a cool idea, but we just can't we can't do that. That you was know, also just, that was also you know almost three weeks ago when this was still in its infinitesimal stages. I very, think we're now trying true. to really realize the implications of. We have MLB so, level knowledge now. We used I to have UFC level knowledge. Now we have state, MLB. The state level of knowledge. Florida would. I don't think the state of Florida would allow them to do that now. It's with with no. us on lockdown the way we are. We have to think it's even nowhere in, in, in the conversation. I you just. Know, Mm-hmm. Sorry, go one, ahead. Guys, so one more thing to talk about, just another downside, because this was an interesting point that uh, Jeff Bailey had on. Jeff Bailey, he trains a lot of professional fighters here in um, in Tampa. He's one of my black belt brothers, a good buddy of mine. We talked about him earlier, with, with him earlier on the, on the podcast. He brought up the fact that it's unfair to the fighters simply because they won't have access to quality training partners or a quality training regiment, what they're accustomed to, to get ready for what a true UFC caliber fight will entail. So, you know, you're dealing with these guys they are going out there to put everything on the line and they're going in half asked because they just can't uh, get their, their crew together. He even mentioned, he said they were only going to be allowed to bring one coach with him. And anybody that knows anything about one corner man, anything knows anything about uh, MMA. It's, yeah, that you you need your striking guy, you need your jujitsu guy, you need your head coach. You know, you need there's it's you need any any you need MMA. familiarity. You and need that's familiarity. historically what you get. Right. You know, right. like well, and you, and weird things. These guys, some some of them, not all of them, but some of them are very uh, very routine oriented. And like they got they got to have this green drink in the morning when they wake up. They want to have their eggs. They want to be able to go to this, sit down here, listen to this music, and spar with that guy and train with that guy. And it kind of messes with their internal mechanisms. Yeah, it's GSP true. was famous that way. He was he was he was a very he was a very he used to get sick all the time. I think was his thing. That's right. That's yeah. that's right. He was yeah. he was one of those guys. He would throw up before his fights. I think wouldn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah. I was. I, I get that way too. I fucking, I literally before a competition, I will literally get to the point to where I am, I psych myself out so horribly that I will become physically ill. Like I'll, I'll psych myself into a cold, or I'll have some kind of like elbow. Like things will start to go wrong because I'll make myself believe to try to come up with any reason to, to pull out. I've it's had the honor to call call one of your jujitsu fights before, and. Uh, I've seen you. I've seen you getting into that mode, and if I can do my best KG real quick. <laughs> oh, I have I'm the reigning KG impression as champion right now. So you gotta. All right, that's, that's, I'm sorry. It's true. No, it's very Kevin, true. Kevin is a 19-time world champion. We can never. <laughs> no, it's it's only three, but I appreciate you, Mark. No big deal. I did oh, win the world yeah. three times. Thank you for bringing it up. Three times. Thanks champion. for reminding me after I remind text, text Johnson, Thanks text for reminding Johnson me. Text Johnson good to me. Text Johnson good to me. You know, it's like he's a <laughs> he's a freaking well, half ass. <laughs> Fucking, you know, now that we're done with all that, she still got some time. I don't know. Yeah, fuck yeah. Um, talk, have you I actually, anymore? real quick, I had one thing that I, I almost don't want to bring this up again because, like, the beef is something that I don't think will ever go away, no matter what efforts are made. But I, I have to. Uh, you've been in the the MMA journalism sphere for the better part of twenty years now, right? Like you said, fifteen years. I've been in media broadcasting and media. radio for for fifteen years. MMA, a solid, like actually credentialed about five. Okay, so like half a decade, and I that with how young the sport is, that's that's yeah. a, a fair chunk might, of time. Might as well the, be a seasoned old fucking. Uh, old, that's about uh, a decade of, of football smoking, broadcasting. Uh, you know, I right. was but, I was definitely among a very select few when I first started doing media at the events, and then really? now now it's like. You know, which is again place. why I, which is again why I always compliment you because you really, I mean, you had that, I had, you had that damn radio show on. I can remember before fucking when I was like a blue belt when people really didn't know what the, wow. what the hell, you know, but what the hell fucking jujitsu was, you know? Yeah, yeah but yeah, yeah. cool, man. Um, yeah, no, and so, so, yeah. No, I was just, I was just going to say, like, you know, um, now it's kind of like, 
I fucking agree with Dana White so much that now <laughs> MMA media are the weakest and wimpiest people out there. I mean, before you had guys like a, one of them, I totally forgot his name, but it doesn't matter. Old dude, solid guy. You know, he gets it. They're, they're, they just get it. And they don't, you barely see them because they're, they're not like me. I want to be on camera. I'll, I'll admit it. There's nothing wrong with being self-aware and admitting it, but they don't care about that. You got guys like Randy Harris, who's from, from, from Florida as well. He's been doing this shit since like the first UFC. And when the hell do you see Randy Harris anywhere? Because those are the guys that are, you know, they, they, they kind of get it, you know, and now what it is when you go to UFC and you go to the media room, it's like the cafeteria at a college. It really, that's what it is. And it's, and they, they really are. I mean, I've, I've seen, I've seen them talking shit about fighters. I've seen them talking shit. I'm not going to name who, because that that's not a good thing to do, but I sat in the media room where some fucking dickhead who's credentialed sat there and ran his mouth about one of the fighters that me and Kevin like that are from Tampa that I'm not going to mention the name because I don't want to do that. But these are the kind of people who are covering the sport. Right. And I didn't go and tell that fighter that because I should. I thought I was like, should I tell him that? Because the last thing I'd want is for somebody that I I actually like like and I support this guy for him to look somebody in the eye and smile and shake their hands and give him an interview when they just fucking buried his ass right here when they when they walked yeah. out of the room after the interview. So right. I see a lot of shit that where I come from, and this is where that that old joke where you come from doesn't fucking matter. But where I come from, that kind of shit doesn't fly. You yeah. get fucking you're out of the room in that instant. Like you're going, I don't, you're not part of what you're doing anymore. Yeah. I don't think I would ever be able to really. I actually got the chance to roll with uh, an MMA fighter before he made his UFC debut. His name's Kama Worthy. I was living in Pittsburgh at the time and training at his gym, and he's just such a such a great guy. Does, Avery, he, tra- does he train under Sarah? Is that uh, Matt Sarah's guy? I don't. Uh, the- I don't know. I don't think so. It's a Kama. He's a he's he runs. You know the who I'm Pittsburgh- talking about Mark, light heavyweight. He finished that. Uh, Nah, Comma worthy. Nah, he's got nah, a. Nah, he's got nah, a mohawk. Nah, not not but, a lightweight. Not lightweight. Familiar, but, yeah, okay, so so he hadn't gotten the call to to fight on a UFC card yet. That would happen like a few months later. But we, I, I showed up because on the the schedule it said there was an open mat, and I showed up and I was the only one there. And he's like, "Oh, it got rescheduled." He was there, Queen, and he's like, "But you're here. Like, let's roll." And he kicked my ass from pillar to post for like 40 minutes. He was just like, man, you're wrestling. Like he was re- like rolling with me. And he's just like, you know, your wrestling is really not good. And then he's like, we have a wrestling class here. <laughs> I can he, help just, with that. He, he just beat my ass, but he always had a goofy grin on his face. He's like, never, no ego about it. That's where that, you see that true athleticism, that elite level athleticism. It's, yeah, it's, and it's, that, once you can start getting your purple belt a little bit mid purple belt, that you can negate that. It's tough as a blue belt. Yeah, this is just my way of saying, hey, like Kama's super famous, and I knew him for a minute, so like, whatever. <laughs> this, he, he 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 like got like K like first KO of the night when he went onto the UFC. Like he, uh, Joe Rogan showered him with praise. It was awesome, and I'm like, that guy kicked my ass. It was awesome. But, That's great. Yeah, I, I wanted to actually ask about because historically in sports. Uh, there's been a, a little bit of a stigma against MMA and you got that with like guys like, you know, Stephen A not fully getting some things and it, it just comes off cringy, even if they're trying hard. But I want to talk about Max Kellerman. Max Kellerman annoys me because he's very good at his job and he's a, a decorated combat sports journalist, you know, covering boxing, super cool guy. And he even like, there was a moment where I'm like, Oh, Max Kellerman's our guy. Because they were talking about the box, like the 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 Tyson Fury fights, uh, and he was like, "We can't uh, we can't call this the winner of this the best man alive because like MMA, there's more skill sets. So I think Stipe would probably beat Fury. I'm like, oh, he's our guy. But then he said, like in reference to the cowboy, or like he, it was it was a boxing match, and he's like, you know, this is why it's it's different than MMA. There's no mechanism for quitting. You know, you just got to hang in there. And I'm like, okay, now that's that. I got a problem with man. That's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know why he said that. That is kind of silly. Cause you can quit in boxing. That's yeah. obvious. Well, you're, you can quit whenever you want. You're quit. Well, you, can, like, you can also, you can tell him after you're done. Roberto yeah, Duran, Roberto right. Duran said no mas, you yeah, know, he, that's, that's quitting. Quit right. 
Man, I've seen some of those videos on YouTube, and you see the the trainers trying to shove the mouth guard back in their mouth, like, "No, get out there and fight!" It's like, "Oh my <laughs> god!" Uh, so bad. Sorry, man. Crazy. <laughs> right, right. No, you're not gonna fucking do this to me. Get the fuck in there. Shut up, you little and, bitch. And, and up, real quick, cool. I just want to say that, like, I think Max Kellerman is one of the best sports journalists alive today. I really do. He's a right. he's a consummate professional. Really feels like he interacts with these athletes and specifically fighters. Like with a, a level of dignity that I I truly I have, admire. I, you know? Go ahead and finish, but make sure I get to talk. Yeah, about this. yeah, yeah. So I, I I'm, it's both of you. What do you think is is it just a matter of time? Is it the the level of professionalism in the presentation that's keeping uh, a lot of mainstream sportscasters from doing their homework on MMA and doing their homework so that they 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 come off as it, as genuine to like the real fans that really follow it or. You know, am I, am I just making? Am I making a problem out of nothing? You no, know? I think you have a definitely a great. That's a great conversation. Um, can I pull a, a Joe Rogan guest and just can I slip away for ten seconds and use the number one? Hello, Boom. everybody. We're back from a brief bathroom break, and Mark was about to blow our minds with some next level MMA journalist <laughs> takes. We were let's talking. Go, we were talking about. To, yeah, the we were talking about the the disparity between um like traditional media. It's that long debate. You know, you got those videos of Joe Rogan debating boxing with like a, a boxing guy, and it's this there's this antagonism that doesn't seem to be there anymore. But this, there's sportscasters that unless they're real MMA guys, like you know, like uh, Dominic Cruz, who's a fighter but also a, a maniac on the mic. You know, John Anik, Kenny Florian, these guys that are really good at it. Like, what what, are you, what were your thoughts on that? It's a great question. Um, and I strongly believe, and I'm not making this about myself, but I strongly believe that I can relate to this quite a bit. Right. It's one of the reasons I really believe that I'm, I, I'm, I believe, you know, that this, this outlet of media, this niche was for me because I was in martial arts from the age that, from um, third grade, I was in wrestling for nine years for all of my schooling. And then from seven years old, I was in Tang Sudo for about six years. And, uh, you know, I, I, I trained a little bit of boxing. But the point is, and I watched UFC one live at my aunt's house. I stole it on her black box. Hmm. The point is, you can't do your homework on this. You cannot do your homework on this industry because they all do. Max Kellerman will probably be one of the best that can fake it because he's not an MMA guy and he's the best boxing guy. I I, I got to say that. But Max is the man. They all do their homework, but you can't fake this. You can't right. fake the instinct of knowing. I don't right. train, but I've been around it my whole life so I can keep up the conversation. I've been around it my whole life. Ariel Hawani, he's been, never trained a day in his life, but the kid was at the water before all the other horses. So he learned, learned and learned for all these years. OK, that's the difference maker is it's instinct, man. It's a lot like fighting a, a vet. You know, you might you might you might be good. But a guy like Anderson Silva, he's not going to let you put that game plan on him like Adesanya. He's just too smart. He's been around it too long. The instincts are too much. So it's the same thing with these MMA media guys. You don't think Stephen A. Smith sat there for hours, probably all night, the night before watching MMA, reading all that stuff, all that. He's just you can't fake it. It's just that simple. Like he, and that's why I I'm sticking to this business because, you know, in life you kind of have to go with something. You know, you can take chances, you can learn new things, and all about that. But in life, you kind of have to go with what you're really good at, what you really know. So with that in mind, I realized, you know, I do know a lot about the combat sports industry. You know, and and I say that humbly as possible. But at the same time, you know, that's the driving one of the driving factors for what I do. You know, a guy like Stephen A. Smith, he probably doesn't ever want to fucking do anything with UFC again because he got buried and his confidence is out the window, even though he didn't act like it because he's Stephen A. Smith. He knows how to be a gamer. He's a gamer with this shit. He knows how to bounce back. But at the end of the day, you know, he went home and said, man, fuck the MMA shit. I don't even want to do it. I want NBA. I want NFL. Yeah. That's what I want. So. Like, and, and to be fair, like if I made the effort, like I like watching football, but if I made if I made an effort of talking, like doing a football podcast and a topic that didn't begin and end with Tom Brady's the goat came up, I'm like, well, shit, what's, uh, that, uh, is Gronk still in it? No, shoot. That's my other thing I can talk about. Uh, 
Tom Brady's now a buck, by the way. Just FYI. So TB, TB. Hey, TB12, TB12. It's, it's crazy <laughs> because I'm so consumed with all this COVID shit that I can't even like get excited about the fact that we have the greatest quarterback of all time. As a oh, he's smart. Guy. He signed a deal for $30 million with the Bucks, knowing he wasn't going to ever play a fucking game in his life. <laughs> yeah, Got that bonus. Are you kidding me? <laughs> he's like, yeah. What's my signing now, bonus? Now I, I like him. Long? Now I like him even. Now I like I, him even more. Hurry up and sign that fucking contract. Fuck yeah. There was, there was a great tweet from this. Uh, this smaller YouTuber, Cosmonaut, or the, not not a smaller. He's huge, but like he's sort of. Uh, I don't know a lot of people that know him outside my circles. His name's Cosmonaut Variety Hour. Amazingly funny dude. He put out this tweet <laughs> that that cut me to the core, saying, "Man, it's like Kobe was the last Horcrux for planet Earth, and now we're just slowly <laughs> going nuts. Like funny. we're gonna end up in the cool. sun by that's the by funny. the month's end. We're just gonna <laughs> spiral out of our <laughs> the orbit." Final Horcrux. That's pretty Horcrux, funny. Yeah. Yeah. The Earth is being swallowed into a black hole right now. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I just I just want to say one thing about the the Stephen L. Seth Max Kellerman issue because I have a particular thought process on that, and cool. I I agree with you to a lot of extent. I I feel like this is the perfect opportunity to start uh you know uh, promoting from within to give guys that uh that have more knowledge like yourself that have true knowledge of um of the MMA spectrum, the opportunity to go out there and, and talk about it, like the knowledgeable per people that they are, um, you know, and then you kind of like you, t- you have knowledge of the, of the subject and then you learn to become a better broadcaster based upon that. I think that there's also another side of that, that makes me want to think that you need guys like Stephen A. Smith and Max Kellerman to talk about MMA in order for it to get to that next level, in order for it to become more commonplace. Like you need Stephen A. Smith to go on his show. I forget what it is when he goes against the other Skip Bayless. I forget what the name first is. First, take. In, first, in, is first in 10 or first take or something like first that. Take, yeah. yeah. You need those guys to sit back and talk shit and play count counter, counterpoint against why they feel like uh, Donald Cerrone got an out and you know what maybe they're going to say some things that are off the cuff and they don't really get because they don't really know the sport yet you know but they're going to say it and they're going to get it out there for people to know it and i believe that as they become more aware of the sport their ability to to understand how to broadcast it in a more intelligible manner will grow because they just don't like max kellerman he's an amazing broadcaster anyone that would said he's not one of the best boxing broadcasters ever is an asshole they just don't know what they're yeah. talking about he's amazing in the same regard people that would say that stephen a smith doesn't know sports better than anyone on the planet are just fooling themselves that's his life that's his job that's what he does it's passion that's what he does for a living and he gets paid a million you know lots and lots of money to do it the idea is is sport of MMA is still pretty infinitesimal. You know what I mean? And it's infantile. Sorry, infinitesimal is a different word. <laughs> That's the actual absolute hey, opposite. Hey, swing for the fences, bud. I love <laughs> right. it. It is in its infant stages, right? So, and it's even right. as a mainstream sport, it's even even more, you know, even even lower than that. So, as MMA starts to grow, these guys are going to start to get a little bit better. And it's going to grow into a point to where they're making the right calls. I just, that's just the way I, I gave, I gave Stephen A. Smith, uh, Stephen A. Smith, a pass. I was upset with ESPN for putting him out there because there was a hundred different people that could have done yeah, it that better. Really, Stephen that A. Smith is, is known for being that guy. That is a, a good point. Is that that ESPN? You know, the Disney Corporation has the ability to pluck all the best MMA like talking heads from all around the world just because they're all out there they're doing shows like this people out MMA there, on point. Hawaii, right? one of the best yeah. like mma resource guides on youtube just for like past present future predictions and stuff like that and, and codifying all the history of this stuff in the minute detail that only like really fan like huge fans can do like uh, one of their guys tommy toehold before he was uh, doing stuff with them he was doing- i got commercialized man yeah he, he was he the was best like, oh no 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 <laughs> he was but, the like, best until fox he, took him he did like mm like he did like metamorris breakdowns which is just yeah. like a super like one of the first big independent he's really good. competition he's really good you know that and like media. there's a whole myth there's a whole mythos of just that you know there's like when you're unpacking mma mythology you're un- also realizing that within that there's wrestling mythology there's jiu-jitsu yeah. mythology tkd kickboxing dutch kickboxing like like yeah. muay thai and there's like all these stories like 
you know, Pat Barry was a, a like a, a Muay Thai guy, like just throwing leg kicks before that. There's the Gracies. And there's all this stuff that it's it could be daunting in a weird way because unlike other major sports, you weren't asked to care about it from a young age, like like you had said earlier. Mm. Man, it's it's fun. It's fun though. It's, <laughs> it's fun. I'm I'm excited about it. I I would personally like to see because again, the ESPN and the UFC they like. Maybe it's something to do with the payroll. I don't know. Maybe they were like, hey, we got guys that do this shit. Maybe they're just stubborn to the old school premise. Because, I mean, like to say someone has to be a fighter doesn't necessarily mean they have to be a broadcaster. There's lots of guys like Max Gellerman never boxed a day in his life. I don't know. Maybe he did, but he definitely wasn't a, a huge competitive boxer. But he knows more about boxing than, you know, 90% of the population, right? You don't have to be, you know, a, an ex fighter to be able to do that, but you at least have to know the game. So I think what ESPN is saying. Well, yeah, I, I, because I, 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 and hey, look, you know me, I color, I, I do commentary play by play for a good handful of promotions for the last several years. And I'll disagree and I don't even fight. So I'm actually contradicting my own position. But, but I'll also add that there's an art to, you, you have, you have to have somebody who's at least trained in, in, in something to be the color, the color commentary, because as good as I can, be when I'm at my best and I have, you know, I've got well, the show and all that. I color there, commentary there's... for sure. Color commentary yeah, 100%. Yeah. Like you got to have, you have to know your child yeah. to, to, to do the cover commentary. But for me to but, do it by myself, I, it, it would be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be fair to the MMA fan. I would have to have, I need, I need yeah. a counterpart. You have so, to have some, yeah, you always have the fucking like the point man, you know, that does, that does the work. And then you got the, you know, the color commentator who's the old grizzled guy that freaking, you know, that's been there, done that. And then the idea is that the real broadcast guy kind of carries the show. And then, you know, the, 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 the knucklehead plugs in every once in a while, you know, that, that, that knows the sport okay. may not be the broadcasting guy. Yeah. We're on the same page then. I right. just thought you were saying that the, no. the you know, no, no, the, no, no, no. I, 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 on, you know, you're, misunderstand, or, you're misunderstanding me. I, in a broadcasting scenario 100 it's different when you're when you're actually giving raw data to the community it's different i'm talking about covering mma in any kind of uh reporting yeah. fashion like yeah. you know because there's plenty of of baseball reporters that never played baseball there's plenty of freaking oh, yeah. football I mean, reporters that never played football yeah. you know there's plenty of guys that cover athletics that have never played athlete athletics I mean, like, but are just true fans of the sport ultimate example there are fans that make fan drafts for the nfl draft day like they're like GMs have access to so many pot like piles and piles of hidden medical information and interviews and tapes that we've never seen. And yet a bunch of fans still like think, Oh, Hey, I can take a crack at this. I know who, who's going to save the giants. I know who's going to save the right. Panthers. <laughs> right. Yeah. But I mean, those people aren't necessarily, you know, they didn't go to broadcast school and, exactly. and, and dedicate the, their life to journalism. The journalism either. You know, you have to be able to do both because there's, you know, yeah, you you want someone that knows the material, but you also want someone that's that's you know, that understands what the the art of journalism is really is, and, and it can get to the bottom of things. And you know, and then I don't know in today's world, that shit ain't really important anymore to tell you. Well, the truth, you know what it is, like Col Colby Covington, like him or not, he says something that he made a really good point. He he's basically, and he said this several times, and I know he says a lot of shit, but this one was true. He's like, dude. Most of the MMA media aren't real journalists. They didn't go to college for this. They didn't do it. They just, they just started a, you know, whatever, a YouTube or whatever they right. started and it blew up and it got there. And then maybe USA Today bought them out right. and they became an MMA junkie or maybe Vox Media bought them out and they were MMA fighting. But at the end of the day, these were just fucking kids that had a dream, right? Yeah. And yeah. that's fine. I'm not against that. But at the same time, they, there's, there's not enough people who are, are real broadcasters covering this sport there just aren't enough i went i went, actually went to broadcasting school in uh, in michigan i went to Spex howard you know i've worked at, I, I worked in broadcasting for 10 years before i did mma and that's why i'm ready to steamroll these kids that I'm, i need <laughs> to fucking they're killing me man yeah. i'm telling you i, I agree I, I, I agree with you Mark charles is about to dr leg drop every like little <laughs> piss ant that stands in his way well, let me tell you something brother let me tell you something brother i agree with you in that regard i believe that like when you get to the next level, when you get to something as big, particularly with something that has the ESPN stamp on it, like 
you need to be a real broadcaster. You need to be someone that has credentials that understands what broadcasting is. They're not just going to hire somebody. And on the job, on the on the job experience can be as good as broadcast uh, being a, a trained yeah. broadcaster. Because, for instance, you know, I I I don't know. Maybe I can't name the specific people because I know most of them went to college. But I know there's a handful of kids who. Who, who loved MMA, they started writing articles for like fan sided and the next thing you know, they got hired by something a little bit bigger. And then now they're working, you know, ESPN or somewhere bigger, whatever. And, you know, mo most of them are, you know, they've been in the trenches and they've been behind the camera and they've been editing the videos and stuff for, for years. So they've learned, you know, and, and, and I can respect that. So, you know, I can I can definitely respect somebody who who actually takes the time to learn how to broadcast, even if they don't go to school for it. Because you can do that. You can get internships at TV stations and stuff. Just like yeah, you know, the MMA guys. You know, some of the bigger ones they do that. You know, they'll, you know, I I know some of these kids didn't go to broadcasting school because I watched them and I just know because of their flaws that that someone who's classically trained would know. Let's yeah. get off the subject. I'm I don't want to make this about how much I can't <laughs> right. fucking stand the MMA media. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, listen, like you got guys like Robbie Fox that you you can definitely tell are at least like they're they're really savvy with that sort of information. Oh, MMA fighting just picked somebody up, and I gotta say that was a saving grace for them because they started to get in a certain direction that was weird. No offense to those kids; they're nice people, but it they just hired Mike Heck, Mark, and Mike Heck's doing a good job. I gotta, I gotta stop you. You look too young to be talking like a seventy-five-year-old. Like I, told you, I'm 56. I know, you need, but like you don't you look. Need like you need like a toby and like a fucking like a hat or something like that with your little like uh, old school like. Uh, you gotta look like Groucho Marx. You gotta not have a trendy haircut in the middle. Uh, of you know, it's funny when I was literally in elementary school, in middle school, like I'm talking before the sixth grade. My friends, I remember that they were they weren't making fun of me. They were serious. They used to call me the wise man. And I was in the sixth, <laughs> fifth, sixth grade. So seventh grade. And it was because I was always very analytic and I was always very much able to look at something and say, Yeah, that's not gonna be a good idea. Gamblers you know? gamblers come to you with dog races and go, hey, wise man. I need you <laughs> no, I need you to pick God, me up no. something. I'm in I'm in the hole. I'm in the hole. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you know, I mean, I've just always been an overthinker and, and over the years maybe I've tried to channel it in the right direction because overthinking also equals getting in the way of your own self right so you have to have a balance of you know if you're one of those super analytic people you can't you you don't want it to hurt you right so all right well yeah. I, I i think that is a very uh solid place to end this nearly two hour episode <laughs> two and i thought this marathon. was going to be a shorter one <laughs> but uh mark uh thank you so much for coming on the show is there anything you'd love to plug here at the end or um, are you going to charge me or? Uh... It's, yeah, it's uh, 150 per minute right. of airtime. So you know what? You guys do such a good job. I'll take you up on that. So, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, if if you look up the Octogram MMA, you, you'll find you know all, all the stuff that I do, and then um, I've done, and, and then also if you look up in my in the archives of uh, you, you know Mark Charles Octogram and stuff like that, you'll find interviews with people like Kevin Gallagher as well. So I have a, you know, a long archive that goes back like almost five years. So there was quite a few yeah. bleeps on that a one. Grainy seventies, like seventy right sepia the, uh... tone. Yeah. Kevin's got an afro and he's like dressed up, dressed like studio uh, uh, club <laughs> man. He's got like hope. He's man, <laughs> man, I'm disco Kevin. Disco's here to stay, and they break dances away. That's hilarious. <laughs> you know, when I had Kevin on, he was the first person I ever had to have a notepad next to me. And every time he swore, which was a lot of times, I had to write down the time because I was, you know, it's an FCC regulated show. <laughs> and I had to you write every are... time he swore, I had to write it down, write it down, write it down. And next thing you know, I'm sitting there for like an hour. Just it was a sore hand. <laughs> you know, so the Beasley Media Group paid me like two hours to edit a bunch of KG fucks. So I made I made you I made you an extra two hours on your on your uh, on your, uh, your, your, your time sheet. Let me look at Dude, you one. guys are fucking awesome. This is actually uh, uh, the funnest time I've had in a long time. Oh, and cool, I mean man. that, and I cool, think man. that you guys cool. believe me too. But this is really good. And uh, Kevin, you're pretty good. But buddy, you do a you do a really good job pulling the show together. You 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 know what you're doing, man. Well, Kevin's thank just you very your much. side. Kevin's just yeah. your like yeah, side. Just like you we see, said, this, I'm, okay, I'm, I need I'm to say this. I've been, little, uh, little I've been wanting to say this the whole episode, but like it's crazy that we've gone this long without needing, like, without being confused about naming, like because like just no, like people haven't referred to us as Kevin, 
And we used, we, we used that as a joke for the first episode, which we titled Fistful of Kevins. <laughs> uh, and and that's um, fucking good. That's yeah. a good podcast name. Uh, yeah, good. but like there's a the, we didn't want to ri- there's a fistful. It was more of a joke because there's a okay. podcast called Fistful of Collars, and gotcha. we're just like hey, you can't bit an entire thing for that long. Eventually, unless you want to really push the fistful of culture. If, <laughs> if like if we just supplant, oh, th- that's the that's the new one. We're, we're that's bringing, the title we're of this bringing one. Clint Eastwood fistful back. of fights, fistful yeah. of MMA, fistful, fistful of nuts. Of culture, yeah, fistful, fistful of nuts. <laughs> we, I see. I. Fistful I see uh, <laughs> like trademarking here. Fistful of os, just fistful of os, just hot. I'll hold good. it in your hand. That's All right. Nice. Well, we're tired, and uh, this was a very good endorphin break from the hellscape that combat sports <laughs> is currently entering. <laughs> that we found out about. Yeah, in real time. Yeah. Right. In so, real time. And good job catching that. Good job catching that because I always try to keep my phone face down when I'm not running the show. Good I have an catching. alert set specifically for Kit, so I, I, he goes through. The boss man goes through. Boss man goes I, if I'm smiling, just know in my heart, I'm devastated. <laughs> I have been your host, Kevin Bradley, joined as always by my co-host, Kevin Gallagher, and amazing guest. Hope to have him back sometime. Uh, MMA journalist Mark uh, Mark Charles. You can catch him on the Octagram. We'll provide links when we uh, post this to the Jiu-Jitsu Times site. But as always, uh, stay safe. Uh, train hard, and remember that this will all be over eventually. Oh, by the way, I do have a uh, stand-up comedy show that's two Tuesdays from now, if anybody in Tampa wants to come to. It's at... Just kidding. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, 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 I was going to think, I, like, I, was, I just what wanted to get this over with. I was like, yeah, doing, true, man, whatever, dude. <laughs> I'm kidding. Hey, Mark, everybody you stay got, home you, guys, you guys got preachers telling pe- everybody to come out because <laughs> the God will protect that God will protect that dude's in, You know what's funny? That dude's in jail, and they let, like, uh, 500 people out of the St. Petersburg Pinellas jail, and that dude they put in jail. That's funny. I mean, yeah, keep him away from people you can talk to. All right. Oh, stay safe, wash your hands, Thank and you. uh, be good Mark, to your neighbor, eat your vegetables, and Mark, all that stay on, stay on for a second. Have Mark. a good one. All right.